Have you seen Steve Deperell yet? Not yet. I'm keeping an eye out for him. Enjoying music. Trying to push get started because it's nine o'clock. Thanks, Karen. It's always nice to have some music in the morning. Um, okay, so it's 9 a.m. So welcome. Thank you all for coming to day two of the Adaptive Management Forum. My name is Cheryl Patel. I am the California Sea Grant State Fellow with the Science-Based Adaptive Management Unit, I'm working with Karen and her team. And I'm gonna be moderating this session this morning called Closing the Adaptive Management Loop, 
During this session, we'll have speakers talking about the final steps of the adaptive management cycle and giving us a little bit of information about lessons they've learned and um, best practices for information sharing and more. So just a few notes here before we get started. Um, I want to just remind you, please turn your cameras off and your mics off while you're not speaking so we can hear our presenters. Um, Feel free, if you have any questions, put them up into the chat. We'll try to get to them. If you're having any technical issues, please email us at engage at deltacouncil.ca.gov or you can text or call the phone number on the screen. Um, if anyone's on the phone, I'll read it out real quick. It's 916-798-9817. And um, just for information, this session is being recorded. Um, we also have a link to our mural board in the chat. It's coming up right there. So if you have any thoughts or comments you want to add during the session, please feel free to go over there and give us some of your thoughts. We'd love to see them over there. And then for this session, we're going to take questions from you all after every presenter. So you can use the raise your hand function or you can add questions to the chat and we will get to as many as we can after each presentation. All right. So um, without further ado, I'm just going to go ahead and have Stuart Siegel start us off here. So please welcome Stuart. He's going to be talking to us about what happens when you're closing, closing the loop and, you know, that can happen whether you plan for it or not. So Stuart, if you're here, feel free to take it away. I thought I saw him this morning. Oh, there there we go. <laughs> Thanks. Good morning, everybody. I hope my screen share is visible. Is that correct? I don't see it yet. Me don't either. see it yet. Share screen. How about now? Now I see it. Wonderful. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Stuart Siegel. I am the Coastal Resilience Specialist with the San Francisco Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve and research professor at San Francisco State. And what I want to talk about today is the idea in the adaptive management cycle about closing the loop um, and then uh, in various ways that whether you plan for it or not, that closing the loop can happen. So I want to uh, tackle some, some ideas in that whole regard. Um, and fundamentally, what I want to be able to do here is really get a, a um, why it is so important. And obviously this entire uh, workshop is all around this, and I just want to kind of emphasize certain aspects of it. Um, first off, I think we're all quite familiar that, that projects take a long time to make happen. And one of the things that we need to be able to do, I think going forward is see if we can find ways to shorten that time. And adaptive management is a tool that can help take us there. Um, one of the points that, that came up yesterday and I want to emphasize is that um, our clock is kind of running out. Climate change is really picking up pace and uh, we need to pick up what we're doing in response. And I'll get to that just a little bit more. Um, a point that I really like to make is that, um, and this came up yesterday as well, is the way I like to call it is nature bats at will. And um, it's quite possible nature will do our implementation for us and we may not like what nature gives us because we weren't ready for it and it might take us in different directions. Um, we heard yesterday about um, from Laurel Larson about extremes that are projected in the future. Um, we heard from uh, Brittany Davis that the Yola bypass that when it's really dry they can't run their experiments and so this is what nature throws at us. So really be attentive to uh, we don't have as much control as we think we would like to have. Um, the next part I want to emphasize, and I'll touch on briefly, is we know a lot, and which is fantastic. And there's a lot that's been done, we know a lot, we understand a lot, so we really want to build on that. Um, and just drive home the point that, that all this together um, really drives the necessity that we put our best feet forward, which we're very capable of doing, and we're doing a lot of that right now. So I'm going to pick an example about how we know a lot already, and it can really help us uh, move things along. And uh, I'm a wetland restoration scientist, so I, of course, pick on restoring tidal wetlands, but um, this applies to lots of other stuff as well. So um, full credit to everyone else doing other work on other aspects of the system. Uh, very important, but they also know quite a bit also, uh, as well. So if you want to ask the question, 
um, what does it take to really support the resiliency of the estuary's tidal wetlands uh, with sea level rise? We do know things. So the first thing that we know is when you do restoration work, you get to the endpoint a lot faster if you start closer to high marsh elevations. And so if you look at this map on the right, the kind of dark green, which is the perimeter of the delta and parts of Susum Marsh, for example, um, when you do restoration at places that are higher up, or if you use dredge material to bring things up to that point, um, close to that point, then that gets us much, much closer to resiliency. Um, we know, for example, that uh, promoting sedimentation and plant accretion is a really critical piece. That's how wetlands work in the system historically uh, with, sea, with uh, sea level rise over the past several thousand years. Is, is that dynamic between the, the rising of the tides and how much uh, the marshes can keep pace with them. Uh, and then lastly, we also know this whole notion of expanding into the adjacent uplands. That's how all the estuaries wetlands formed historically. And as much as we have the opportunity to try to restore wetlands on, on lands that have a very gentle slope on the edge and that there's no interfering land use, those are really our optimal opportunities. And on the map, that's these very shades of light green around the edges. And it's kind of obvious that you can see that the delta is quite flat. There's a lot of those kind of places. Susun has um, got some areas, but it's more constrained either by development or by hills that come down to the edge. So this just helps us get a sense that we do know a lot and we can really move forward based upon that. Um, what I want to touch on a little bit is this issue of, of climate change and why um, I think the adaptive management is so important because our time is ticking away. Um, uh, NASA just put out recently their uh, assessment of 2020 and it was the tide for the warmest uh, year on record. Uh, and if you look at the, the graph on the right there, um, it's accelerating and we we see this. And uh, uh, one of the things disturbing the map on the left is how much warming is in the in the polar Arctic because that has a lot of, of feedback mechanisms globally. Uh, so we don't have a lot of time to keep thinking uh, too plottingly about stuff. Um, so this accelerating warming that we're seeing really drives the need to accelerate our response to the issue we're facing here. Um, a point I'll make also is that the ocean atmosphere system is tightly coupled and it's a very slow system to respond. It's taken us decades to do what it's doing and it will take us decades to slow down. And so even if we did a perfect job of greenhouse gas level reduction now, it'll still be a lot of baked in change coming our way no matter what. Um, and so the benefit of picking up our pace is that we have a lot of things we're trying to achieve that are laid out in the Delta plan, Susu Marsh plan, and others planning documents. The faster we get going intelligently, the greater likelihood that we'll actually be able to get to where we're trying to go. And so that really um, is a driver for the role of adaptive management. Um, so uh, on this theme, the adaptive management is one of our tools. Um, we've touched upon quite a bit that projects take a long time and 10 to 20 years is not uncommon and it would be great to see that become five to 10 years or closer to five years. And there's a lot that goes in there and everybody who's here probably has their hand in projects in many ways and understands all the different aspects that drive that. Um, what came up yesterday, um, which I like to emphasize as well, is, is you don't get to do things to get a permit. And the permit process is incredibly complicated. Uh, and I'll put a plug in to there's the uh, permitting workshop this afternoon. Highly encourage everyone to attend that. Um, and uh, if you want to change the landscape, you need permits. And so unless nature does it for you. Um, the next part is that that once you do something, the outcomes you're trying to achieve, they take time to develop. And, and that's if you're doing wetland restoration, that can take a long time. Some other kinds of actions see their changes much more quickly. Um, but it's really important to recognize that even once you spit that 10 or 20 years, or hopefully five, that once you, you hit the go button, you still have to wait for what you're um, trying to accomplish to, to show its results. And then really to touch on what Phil Eisenberg uh, brought up yesterday in his talk was, Everything we're doing is in the context of very complex social dynamics. Um, those are driving very uh, uh, diverse interests and um, which leads to some very divergent goals and objectives and visions. And we have to figure out ways to try to reconcile those as much as possible. And that is probably many of you know is, is inherently quite challenging. Um, 
And one thing that, that often, but not always, is the case is that you tend to get more community support of what you're trying to do if they're involved um, in the planning process, but that doesn't work 100% of the time. Um, but th that's a, a general rule that helps get you to that. And that really brings back to the whole adaptive management cycle. And there's education and community involvement and, and knowledge gaining that really fits into that whole aspect. Um, so on the idea of planning to close a loop, this is really a lot of what this workshop is about. And Mike Healy really brought attention yesterday to the notion of, of conceptual models. It's deeply baked into uh, what started with CalFed years ago and, and, the, uh, and the Stewardship Council, talked about things around the country and around the world. Um, I'm a big fan of conceptual models personally, and I just want to kind of point out a couple things that on the bottom right is an example that Chris Enright did about 10 years ago, just looking at hydrodynamics in Susu and Marsh and the, the, how things work and help understand how you might want to tinker with the system a little bit. Uh, on the bottom left is one that myself and others put together for a water quality um, for the duck clubs in Susu and Marsh. This is just an example of the DREWIP style conceptual models that uh, I like to point out that um, they can that approach can be used to generate very simple models. We don't need huge, complex, difficult to digest things that can be done very simply. And in the way we use it here, for example, those red boxes, uh, we identify things where we have a management knob and being able to see where those knobs are and how effective they might be and if they're implementable really is a way you can put conceptual models to use. Um, but keeping them clear and simple is a very key thing. Um, the whole idea of staying focused, the, all the things that we do is there's a lot of possibilities. And uh, if we make good conceptual models and we spend our time testing them and find um, what works and doesn't work and what we do and don't know, that can really help us to do all the next things we do, uh, undertake the things we do next really clearly um, and with, with uh, strong intent there. Um, a key thing in adaptive management is the idea of lessons learned, and this is really synthesizing a lot of knowledge um, in very much applied fashion how we might actually use it. And so, for example, this is where the Delta Science Program has is, is invested quite a bit of effort and is doing plenty more. Um, and I really uh, applaud and emphasize the value of doing that because that's how we can understand um, what we might want to be doing next and what makes sense for our meeting our goals and objectives and visions. Um, to do that, one of the things that came up yesterday, uh, not the only thing is, is we need money to do it. We need both long-term and consistent funding to carry this out. That, that starting stopping money really interferes with the ability to do those long-term syntheses as well as is doing the original work that, that tests our conceptual models. So really the plug there. Um, but on the other side of that coin that came up yesterday that we need the mechanisms to assure all this gets done. And so we heard that sometimes it's not just the money, but there's a lot of, of, of barriers within institutions that make it hard to spend money or money is not the issue there. So we need to take care of those barriers. We need to make sure the staffing is there. Uh, we need to make sure the programs exist and have the mechanisms to really put those lessons applied to work. And that applied lessons is that closing the loop part of the adaptive management cycle. Um, now we move on to the idea of without prior planning. And so, um, the idea of lessons learned um, is that they're not automatically part of any adaptive management endeavor. So um, we might have things planned uh, or we they just things that are out there in the landscape that we can take advantage of. Um, these two types I'll talk about is in essence, what's happening in the landscape are in some version an experiment that we can learn from. And we just have to figure out how to extract that knowledge most effectively and for what we need to do. One of those types of of, of, of opportunities out there are past projects. And those might be intentionally done old restorations. They can be naturally occurring restorations. And, and this picture is Liberty Island in the background there that has uh, received quite a bit of study. That was a natural levee failure that left unrepaired 4,500 acres. Um, a lot of knowledge has come out of Liberty Island as an example. Um, but those things didn't have um, a, a planned adaptive management program and monitoring. So um, it's, a, it's an example of how we've gone back and extracted knowledge, and there's a lot more knowledge the system has to offer us that can help us moving forward here. Um, and then this idea of naturally occurring actions that can be um, the ones that happened in the past, such as Liberty, Frank's Track, and so forth. It can be things that we fixed, like uh, Jones Track, that we learned a lot from Jones Track. 
And we have to recognize that things are going to happen in the future that we can also learn from. We're going to have more floods and more levee failures. We'll probably have earthquakes, all this kind of stuff. Um, and I'll emphasize here that that um, everything we know about climate change is uh, that we have a greater likelihood of having uh, what I call change causing events. And so um, we've, we've fortified the system up to a point, but uh, nature bats at will. So we don't know uh, always what's going to happen there. Um, so what I want to kind of talk about getting more knowledge out of our past restoration. So Liberty is one example, um, but there's a lot more examples. And so these are two maps that are um, seven years old now. And so a lot of the restorations that have been uh, uh, built or planned since then do have adaptive management plans, which is fantastic. Um, but going back to a bunch of these different places really helps us out. And so looking, for example, at the, other, the what's blue in this map, the restored tidal marshes, be they um, you know, Sherman Lake, the edge of the Delta, parts of Chips Island, Ryer, moving to the Napa salt ponds along San Pablo Bay, even the South Bay salt ponds. We've done a lot of these restorations and some have been really examined and some have not been. Um, we do have this very bizarre category of muted tidal marshes. Sometimes they're restored, sometimes they're incidental. It's kind of a vague category, but this kind of brown the landscape, we see a lot in Susun in particular, both on the, the Solano and Contra Costa County sides. And then to some extent, these naturally formed marshes that are um, post gold rush, some, some of those can be very informative for us, not necessarily all of them, but there's some real opportunity there to see how things might work and how we can really promote things like marsh resiliency and the recovery of the of ecological functions for uh, fish, for birds, for other wildlife. A lot of opportunity sits out there. Um, kind of drilling into Susu Marsh because it's obviously one of the real focus points here. One of the things I want to emphasize is that to date there has been no um, uh, assessment restoration uh, of restoration assessment of Susu Marsh wide. That's something that the science program has taken a, a real uh, dive into right now, which is fantastic. Um, some of these places have had research, like Blacklock. A lot of folks have gone out there, but some places um, not so much. And uh, so I'm going to kind of use this map to kind of illustrate the different types of places that exist in Susun, and it's very limited, and I'll come back to that limited opportunity issue. Um, so there, there are four prior constructed restoration projects that are older uh, in Susun Marsh, only four. That's not a very large number, and so Black Lock is the one that, that um, has been given a lot of attention there. The other three are in the very southwest corner of Susun Marsh, and that's it. There are no more older ones in Susun. That's a very small sample size to, to draw from. Um, if you look at the idea of natural occurring restorations that are older, and, and I picked 15 years, which is semi-arbitrary, um, ultimately it's kind of how far along the, from where they started to being more of a high elevation mature marsh. There's eight, eight of these in Susun marsh total. Um, there are several along this, the um, Honker and Susun bays in that south end there, and there's a little tiny one up Montezuma Slough those potentially could be very ripe for looking at the effects of, of restoration. Um, and then we've got um, four more recent ones. And again, it's 15 years semi-arbitrary. So we've got um, some along Honker Bay. We've got a pretty new one along Nurse Slough. And there's a slightly older one along um, Arnold Slough. And then uh, yeah, I guess a couple along uh, Honker Bay there. So each of those in the, the rate of evolution of restoration um, and how much uh, these natural systems work. Some of them have worked great, some not. You know, I think a lot of people might know that that CHIPS entirety is being examined for enhancement of those restorations because sometimes what nature did for us didn't really give us something we might want to have out there. Well, the next point I want to really emphasize is when we do this is to really try the value of overlapping studies because the more we overlap the places we go to from lots of different folks doing work, the more we learn. And so one example of this is Ryer Island that I think I heard yesterday that um, uh, is a focus of quite a few folks. It's, it's a great place in many ways, although it's challenging, it's hard to get to. Um, but on the left here, for example, is overlaying some of the long fin smelt sampling that Lenny Grimaldo's group did a few years ago uh, in this whole part of Susun, uh, overlaid with the um, Department of Fish and Wildlife's uh, triennial uh, vegetation mapping of Susun Marsh. It can start relating vegetation community types to uh, where the where fish sampling results are, are coming out. Um, on the right, we went out a few years ago and did a bunch of, bunch of bathymetric and topographic surveys in Rye Island to get a sense of what the sloughs there are like. 
Um, and, and I know there's a lot more data for, for Rider and there's other places out here. So the, the, the degree to which all these folks are doing different things can, can find and work in similar places and then that knowledge gets synthesized, there's a lot more to be gained out of that. So really important there. Um, so the idea of putting all these opportunities to use, um, a big part is to stay focused. What do decision makers need to know? And there's a, different types of decision makers, but really all this work that we're doing is, is going after the things that we really need to know. And I think we're doing a really good job of doing that now. There's a lot of emphasis um, coming from the Delta Science Program and by a lot of the, the um, researchers of different institutions doing this. And it's really great to see that. And it's really important. Um, really recognizing that when it comes to doing this, the world is imperfect, that where we have to go is where we have to go, and it may not fit along these wonderful gradients of, of, of scientific questions that we can lay out of our conceptual models. And we just have to recognize that where we have to kind of, we have to fit what we want to do to what the landscape has to offer us. And that's just kind of the way it goes. Um, so in selecting these places to examine, um, the one big question is how representative are these places we study for things where we think we might want to be doing. So the more representative they can be, the more that insight is. Um, that what I just reflected upon here is, is where there's ongoing and past work, we're a lot more cost effective, we get more robust understanding out of that, that work that we do. Um, really, I like to harken back again to conceptual models, clear and concise. They should be the ones directing us to what we want to go after to understand ecological functions, climate change threats, all that kind of stuff. So really emphasize that. Um, thank you very much. I'll wrap up there and uh, hopefully have a couple minutes for questions and then we can move on to the next um, next folks. Thanks, thank Stuart. You. That was a fantastic talk. And we do have time for maybe one quick question if anyone wants to put that into the chat or raise their hand. Go for it. And if not, I have a question, if okay. you don't mind, Stuart. So um, you're talking about, you know, trying to get our projects to be on a shorter time frame, and that sounds really good, but I'm wondering, you know, what are some real life examples of barriers that would have to really be um, broken down to make that possible for future projects? Um, there's probably broadly two or three categories that come to mind. One is is working to, to examine the regulatory process, which is part of the workshop this afternoon, and just finding ways to um, accomplish what that process needs as efficiently as possible. And I think there's a lot of opportunity there, and there's a lot of work being done to try to promote that. Um, the other is to really um, work with the, the communities that are in and near and potentially influenced by the projects that we do so that they are part of that planning process. And so the issues that they will raise are brought up early and tackled and incorporated. I think those two things alone will have a huge effect. And then maybe the last one is, is picking sites that are gonna um, uh, give us the most benefit quickly because they'll be a lot more obvious. Um, but that's probably uh, definitely far behind the regulatory and the community-based planning approaches that I think would really help a lot. Great, thank you. That that was great. Um, and I also I want to oh I see a hand up. You know I'm just going to let this person um, ask a question. Anitra, go for it. You can um, unmute yourself. Uh, you're, you're muted, Anitra. OK, I wanted to ask you a question about how you sort of change the status quo in the permitting world. The fact is, is that so often when you're trying to go back you know, to natural processes using either a floodplain or a tidal marsh system, uh, you get dinged for the habitat that's grown up there in an unnatural setting, right? Maybe you have some trees, um, certain wetland type, certain types of agriculture that support certain species. And then when you get to the regulatory realm, they want to keep it as is and then um, basically have you mitigate to a to an extent that it's very hard to afford your project. So I'm wondering if yeah. you worked on some examples where you've sort of shown regulators what this project will what what the site will look like if you don't do anything, because, you know, if you don't do anything, you said nature will take basically restore the site 
for you, but maybe not in the way you want. So I'm just curious if you have some examples of that, Stuart. Thanks. Um, sure, and I'm trying to see if it's on the agenda here. I think you actually, um, you will hear um, from Meg Marriott later this morning with Sonoma Creek as an example that um, we were su successful in getting a permit to put fill in wetlands of San Francisco Bay to restore wetlands of San Francisco Bay. So we, we dug a channel, we took that dirt, we covered marsh with that dirt and made, uh, we solved a problem by doing that, uh, which was, was really poor drainage and very bad mosquito production. And we gained uh, marsh and upland transition zone and sea level rise accommodation by doing that. And that was an effort that looked at the bigger picture in the longer term and said, Yes, there might be a short-term impact here, but the um, the the near-term and the longer-term benefits of of filling wetlands was positive, not negative, and therefore didn't need any mitigation. And so Meg Merritt's talk will will cover that, and it was very successful. So it, it it's but it's a lot of it, it's it's pulling out to the big picture is really the critical thing, and um, and, and which can be complicated, and the laws that the agencies work under don't necessarily support doing that very easily and that's and that's a challenge that they're that, that the agency staff face every time they have a project in front of them and it's it's hard for them as well as for project applicants to tackle that thank you that's a great example i appreciate it you're welcome great thank you so much Stuart. and um we're going to move on to our next speaker so if anyone has more questions for Stuart or any of the other speakers today feel free to add them to the chat and i encourage our speakers to check out the chat to see um, and interact with our audience so next steve deverell is up to uh, present if he is here i, I hope he's here um, and he's going to be talking a little bit more about um, solutions for the sinking delta so Great, Steve, take it away, or Stephen. Thank you, can you see my screen okay? Yes. Great. So, I don't know if you could call it closing the loop, but I think there are some lessons uh, for what we've done in terms of looking at subsidence over the years. And I thought I'd present today kind of a historical, practical uh, perspective on how that's evolved and, and what the lessons from that might be. If we, uh, we just look at the background, for example, we know that uh, these islands were drained for agriculture in the early uh, 1900s, late 1800s. And we know uh, a lot about the causes of subsidence and it, it's been uh, pretty well divulged over time that uh, subsidence is, is the result of this microbial oxidation that occurs. Uh, that was actually uh, put forth by DWR back in 1980, uh, we also know that uh, raising the water table can stop subsidence. That was actually written by DWR in, in the mid 80s. And then uh, we, we also uh, have experience with, uh, with the effects on levees and DWR wrote in the late 80s, you know, if we stop subsidence, we could greatly reduce the probability of levee failure. So there's a number of things that were written uh, early 80s, late 80s, and then when I was at the USGS, we began a study, a studies to look at what, what we might do to reverse the effects of subsidence. And part of that was getting a handle on this microbial oxidation. Uh, we published the paper in 96 that really connected subsidence to the, to the microbial oxidation and a loss of CO2. So that was the beginning of looking at uh, subsidence reversal wetlands on, on delta peat soils. Uh, we know that uh, we've lost a lot of peat soil, about 5 billion cubic meters of organic soil accumulated during the last 7,000 years. About half of that is gone now. So we have lost a lot of soil and it's, it's uh, played out in many different ways, uh, including levee failure, uh, increasing inability to farm and uh, just general uh, instability on, on Delta Islands. And meanwhile, after knowing uh, these, these things put forth by DWR, uh, Delta Islands kept subsiding. Uh, and really nothing was done about mitigating, or very little was done about mitigating subsidence until, until the early 90s. So 
this is a, a data set. Uh, these points here represent a data set collected by University of California starting in the 1920s that uh, demonstrated this, this loss of elevation that was occurring. And there was a report published in 1950 by Walter Weir and others that really explained not only the subsidence that was going on, but the probable effects and concerns on the part of farmers uh, of the subsidence uh, and the effects on their on their levy investments. And Walter Weir actually said in his report that uh, this is going to increase the hydraulic pressure on levies and uh, that there's going to be problems in the future. So there, there seems to be this, this science practice gap that's occurred over time when it comes to subsidence. And I still experience that. I, I was out on uh, McDonald Island speaking with the growers out there and there, there seemed to be, there still is this idea that that subsidence has slowed down to a point where it's not not really a concern and that using sprinkle irrigation can stop subsidence and the science really doesn't support that. So I think there's a gap here in which we need to begin to close when it comes to not only subsidence, but what mitigates subsidence in the Delta. And, and I'm encouraged that over the last five to 10 years, there has been this speaking out uh, among landowners that uh, subsidence is a key key issue for the Delta and we really need to resolve it. So I think the one of the key lessons that uh, Stuart alluded to, and, and I'll just simply put here, is this interweaving of science and implementation. You know, we ask questions, we do a field experiment, and then we the field experiment leads us to more questions. And there's a there's a loop that goes on there. And maybe that's the closed loop for for uh, adaptive management, but it definitely a big part of this subsidence evolution our evolution of subsidence uh, study in the Delta. The first question we asked was, well, we know that from Gene Pegg's study uh, that these peats accumulated as sea level rose during the last 7,000 years. We also knew that uh, in the early 90s that subsidence was linked to carbon, carbon loss. So why not try a, an experiment on Twitchell Island and see if we can reverse the effects of subsidence by creating permanently, by creating wetlands. So we tried that. Uh, we consulted with people that were uh, in, the, in the business of looking at wetlands for, for waterfowl, principally hunting. And we, so we looked at seasonal wetlands and we looked at permanently flooded wetlands. And this was what we found was the seasonal, the negative means that it's a carbon sink, the positive means it's a carbon source. So seasonal wetlands were a carbon source and don't appear based on the data since then that don't appear to uh, have any, have much of an effect on subsidence uh, reversal. The permanently flooded wetlands were clearly a carbon sink and it motivated us to move forward and implement the first, I think first ever in the world, uh, subsidence mitigation wetland on Twitchell Island it was 14 acres and this is actually Lauren Hastings uh, when she was at the USGS back in the mid 90s when we first started making the sedimentation erosion table on this wetland. And this uh, has led to uh, more and more questions and more and more implementation. So uh, we can see the results of the accretion in this Twitchell Island wetland, which looks like about like this today. Uh, well, when in when it's growing in green, now it's pretty brown out there. But uh, this is data that was presented by Robin Miller in, in 2008, uh, plus a few, few points. And then we went back to those sedimentation or erosion table sites and did more measurements. And so we have this accretion over time that's on the order of about three centimeters per year. So it is a subsidence reversal mechanism that's been demonstrated to function. and. But as I'll bring up later, it's it's a rather slow rate. I mean, it's faster than subsidence is going on out there. So, you know, if you have a couple centimeters or a centimeter a year of subsidence, which is what's going on on Twitchell, right, uh, was going on on Twitchell before wetlands were installed there, you know, you have a, a net gain of, of several centimeters per year. But even then, when you're talking about islands that are 20, 30 feet below land surface or below sea level, you're talking about a long time to come to tidal elevation. So 
that's something to kind of keep in mind here as we go forward. And we know this is mimicking nature. So as we allowed the tulis to grow, and this is really DWR's efforts, Kurt Schmoody and Brian Brock have been really key players in, in moving all this forward. Um, we know that uh, as sea level rose over the last 7,000 years, uh, wetlands kept, kept pace under anaerobic conditions, deposited organic matter and led to the accretion we saw, which uh, resulted in these peat soils. So we keep the water level coming up as we accrete land surface in these wetlands to kind of mimic that. And this is the type of material that, that accumulates. This is Robin Miller's foot next to a really porous and uh, a large amount of biomass. We're talking about 70, 80 percent organic matter in these soils and very low bulk density, but they continue to to accrete uh, over time. And so while this accretion is taking place, uh, there was continued research and implementation. Uh, Brian Brock led the efforts to restore about 1700 acres of wetlands on Twitchell and Sherman. Uh, there's been quantification of the greenhouse gases uh, primarily by UC Berkeley. There's been dozens of papers published. Uh, one in particular by Hemis summarizes about 36 site years of wetlands and agricultural uh, greenhouse gas emissions. We've contributed to some of that. And then, uh, then there's a carbon market. So all this kind of quantification evolved into the writing of a protocol that allows landowners to convert lands and participate in the sale of carbon offsets if so desired. So that was that's one mechanism, perhaps a, an adaptive management strategy that possibly could result in more creation of wetlands. It also allows for conversion to rice, and there is a greenhouse gas benefit to that. We learned that from some of the uh, data that Robin Miller published in uh, in 2000, that if you flood these soils during the wettest, the warmest time of the year, you result, you have a net result of, of greenhouse gas benefit. So here we have this agricultural to wetland conversion uh, on Twitchell, where the blue areas are, and the blue areas on Sherman. These orange areas are also slated for wetland conversion within the carbon carbon market. They're they're listed and, and slated for conversion over time. But you can just see how uh, this is the cornfield that used to exist uh, on in this area on Sherman Island in 2009. There's a tree on the levee here where we used to eat lunch. And then we call it the lunch tree. And then there now it's um, now it's wetlands. These are all filled in, by the way. So this is not too long after it was flooded, but now it's pretty much uh, no open water. There's pretty very little open water. So all this has led to the first ever wetland offset, carbon offsets, certified by the American Carbon Registry this year, or last year, 2020, uh, over 52,000 tons. And this, um, this is, uh, an ongoing process that uh, really there are a lot of people that that, that fed in, that helped with this. Campbell Ingram was a prime mover in trying to move all this forward, and uh, we've been working with the American Carbon Registry. Uh, there was a lot of support from uh, MWD uh, as well as EWR to try to write this protocol and, and move this uh, wetland carbon offset process forward. So just to pause here a little bit and kind of look at where we've been. I mean, we've come from a place where we started this very small mesocosm uh, enclosures on Twitchell, moved to a larger pilot wetland of 14 acres. Now we're at 1,700 acres, and we've done a lot of research in terms of determining the greenhouse gas benefit of conversion of these wetlands and rice. And so now we've we've at our place where how do we do this at a at a larger, even larger scale, an, an entire island, perhaps? So that's really uh, where we are today, as I as I see it. That uh, there's this planning and implementation that's going on in a couple different places to really move from drained root zone crops to 
a mosaic of wetland and rice and uh, possibly habitat or seasonal wetlands for hunting, depending on the soil type. It's really a the soil type is critical here and that the more organic matter you have, the greater the subsidence, the greater the oxidation and the greater the greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we know that there are about 2 million tons of CO2 equivalents that are leaving the Delta every year. Uh, that's about 21% of plant-based agriculture in the whole state. So we've got a pretty small area that's accounting for a lot of greenhouse gas emissions uh, in California. But we looked at this uh, hypothetical mosaic, uh, really no island in particular. We just tried to keep it as uh, anonymous as possible, if you will, and looked at uh, um, greenhouse gas emissions reductions. And of course, with this land use mosaic, you're reducing greenhouse gas emissions up to 83 percent. So this idea has continued to evolve, and we published a paper in 2017 that looked at this possibility for the Nature Conservancy. We've uh, worked closely with Rod Kelsey, uh, Michelle Passero, the wheat, the uh, Zaleke on, on Staten Island to try to uh, move forward in, in creating a more sustainable situation in which uh, subsidence is, is stopped or reversed and uh, reducing the greenhouse gas emissions. So this was uh, what it looked like in 2014, mostly corn. Uh, but then we, in this paper, we looked at the possibility of, of uh, reduction in the corn crop uh, and reduction in greenhouse gas emissions associated with planting rice and wetlands. Uh, there was a slight decrease in profitability associated with this mosaic relative to the 2014 situation, but we have to remember that 2014 was a real big year for for corn prices. So they decreased profitability by about 16%. We're continuing to work with SFEI and the uh, University of California at Merced with uh, Josue uh, Medellin to try to better quantify this. But basically we did a prioritization of these soils because they're the highest organic matter contents. They're the highest uh, or the experience, the greatest subsidence. And so there's actually implementation going on. Uh, the wheat wanted to prove me wrong, and so he planted rice here, but he's very happy with it and it's getting good yields. And he's planning on, they're planning on 4,000 acres of rice over the next five years. There's a wetland planned. There's also eddy covariance towers that are, that are up in a couple of places to continue to evaluate this greenhouse gas uh, emission reduction associated with conversion of these lands. So uh, this is a, another, yet another step in which we move to a, a larger scale in terms of implementing these subsidence uh, mitigation strategies. And so this is, I would be remiss if I didn't share this. I know it's kind of, uh, it's a little bit beyond, uh, beyond what's practical at this point, but we're, but so was, so was creating wetlands on Twitchell Island back in the late eighties, early nineties. People laughed at us, laughed at us then. So uh, feel free to laugh now, but we found that Pete, uh, peat floats. We harvested peat block, a peat block from Twitchell and it floated when we were out in the field with it back in, I think this is 2016, 2017. So we took a bunch of peat blocks from Twitchell and we floated them in, in uh, Doughboy pools. This is Carson Jeffries from the Center for Watershed Science, Sabina Dore from Hydrofocus, and Nick Corline from um, Watershed Science as well examining these peat blocks that have been recently placed in this pool and floating there. And we have eight of them out there on Bolden Island. Uh, this is all sponsored by Metropolitan Water District. Uh, Russ Ryan at Metropolitan and, and Randall Newdeck have been uh, key people interested in, in moving this forward and trying to experiment with this. Uh, we know they float. This is uh, Nick Christian, hydrofocused hydrologic technici technician and uh, illustrating the flotation and they're still floating after uh, we first put these in in mid-2019, they're still floating. So it may offer an opportunity to mimic nature on these deeply subsided islands where we really don't have much hope of reaching tidal, uh, tidal elevations uh, in, in a reasonable time frame. You could float the peat in open water, create tidal habitat, uh, and generate fish food or uh, at least uh, improve the, the, the food web in the Delta, which is, uh, which is lacking at this point. 
So just uh, really to sum up here, you know, I, I would say that, you know, one of the first lessons is start small, uh, first things first, uh, small, small experiments, and then uh, increase uh, in size and complexity as we learn more and more. I think uh, that was consistent with what Stuart, what Stuart just said. So it's a really a stepwise process, and we started out with baby steps and have progressed since then. You know, and this continued curiosity is really important, continuing to ask questions about what we learn, but also continuing to learn from the dialogue. I've learned so much as I go out and talk to growers and about what's going on out there. Since I started working in the Deltas in the early 80s, I continue to learn every time I go out there and talk with people about what they're doing and how they're managing their land. And, and we talk about uh, what the science means. So I think that, that dialogue is really key to kind of bridging this science practice gap, you know, and I, I applaud the Stewardship Council for moving forward with a lot of the work they're doing in that regard. So thanks. Thanks so much. Thank you, Stephen. That was a was fantastic, fantastic talk. Um, um, we have time we have for time maybe for one question, question, if anyone wants to add a question to the chat, I think. Or okay. raise your hand. I see Susan. Your hands raised. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, Steve. I just am wondering what are the next steps with the uh, floating peat? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. And it actually opens an opportunity. We've applied for, we put in a letter of intent to the science program to continue to look at this food web, web benefit. I think there's a a real key question about uh, what the what are the what's the how you quantify that. Uh, so we've got a few researchers from UC Davis to look at uh, metagenomics and uh, biogeochemical pathways. Uh, I, I didn't say that Carson Jeffries has looked at that to a certain extent in terms of you know these these peat blocks uh, do support zooplankton and. Uh, macroinvertebrate populations. And so we're trying to look at how that might work out in terms of an overall supply. Uh, but there's the other part that Metropolitan is very much interested in is how do you scale this up? And so we're having discussions about that and we're also proposing that as a match to this, this science uh, program proposal that we're writing. So uh, there are some opportunities that we see that could lead to Maybe not transporting peat, but maybe just lifting it up and creating a uh, a situation where you've got floating peats that allow for uh, connection with the adjacent channel. But that's that's a little bit beyond uh, what I can say much more about at this point. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, if anyone has more questions, please put them in the chat. And Stephen, if you want to um, answer them that way, we are going to move along so we don't run out of time for our break later. But um, I appreciate your your talk, Stephen. And then we're going to go on to Donna Ball, and she's going to talk to us a little bit about the South Bay Salt Ponds Restoration Project. Hi, I'm getting my share up. Tell me if you can see my slides. Not yet. Okay. Oh dear. Thought I had this figured out this morning. <laughs> no worries. Um, if you do, if they do pop up, let me know. <laughs> yeah. Well. Okay. Um, something isn't working. So you guys have a slideshow, I guess. I thought I had this figured out where I could put it on this no screen. Problem. I think Separate. Brandon has a copy of your presentation. Yeah, yeah okay. I've added some things to it, but um, that's fine. Okay. I'll let him go ahead and put it up. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Great, and while that's um, popping up, um, I'll just say that I'm the lead scientist for the South Bay Salt Pond Restoration Project. And I work 50% time on this project and then 50% time at SFEI, where I work on shoreline adaptation projects and delta projects. So it's exciting for me to get to have um, my feet, ex I guess, extending across the estuary. Um, and Brandon, it still shows the present, it doesn't, isn't in presentation mode yet. It is.
Thanks. Great. And then go ahead and hit the next slide. Thanks. So this, so we're going to move to the southern part of the estuary. Um, the South Bay Salt Pond Project is a public-private partnership. It's a project of the California Coastal Conservancy, and um, landowners are the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And we'll be talking about the 15,000 acres in the South Bay. Next slide. So it's funded from a variety of mechanisms, federal, state, lots of grants, uh, foundation grants, and private um, or corporate donations. Next slide. And these first slides are just quick background for if anyone isn't as familiar with the project. It's located in the southern part of the estuary in South San Francisco Bay. Next. And in the middle of this really urbanized area, so it offers several opportunities, opportunities for the public to be really involved and, and understand the restoration that's happening, as well as opportunities for the project itself to provide, um, through restoration, potential flood control benefits uh, to these really high value property areas. Next slide. So there's three main goals of the project. Uh, first one is habitat restoration. Next. and the opportunity to provide flood control benefits um, and protection. Next. These go pretty fast, Brandon. And then um, opportunity to provide wildlife friendly public access. So next slide. But within that restoration, habitat restoration goal, there are some particular challenges, especially related to um, trade-offs, thinking about creating habitat or maintaining habitat for some of these species that have competing habitat needs. Thinking particularly about, as we think about restoring to tidal marsh, we have a lot of several endangered species who uh, we could create habitat for those species or protect habitat for them. But there are also species that have come to depend upon these salt pond habitats over the last 100 or 150 years. And we need to be cognizant of those and be planning for those species as well. Next slide. Uh, so at the outset of the project, we had a number of key uncertainties, and this just lists a few, but how would the wildlife use these habitats as the habitats evolved? If we are changing, moving from uh, 15,000 acres of former salt ponds into tidal salt marshes, excuse me, and then thinking about things like, well, is there enough sediment in the system to actually make that happen? In the South Bay, there was a lot of mercury mining historically, and so there's a lot of buried mercury in some of these salt ponds, and 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 would restoring those ponds to tidal marsh or um, bringing flows into those marshes result in mercury methylation and impacts to uh, biosentinel species. Now, thinking also, a lot of these ponds were really saline, so as we start uh, opening them or breaching them to the bay, uh, would uh, that saline water have impacts on receiving waters? And at the time the project started, uh, Marilyn Lotto will talk a lot more about uh, non-native Spartina, invasive Spartina, but there was a really big concern with, about opening these ponds, breaching these ponds to tidal action and potentially increasing the amount of invasive species as they um, invaded the ponds. And then would public access, as we opened up and provided public access, how would that impact some of the species that use the marshes and the ponds? And then we did, were concerned early on about sea level rise and climate change, and I'll talk more about that in the coming slides. Next slide. So um, the project developed a really robust adaptive management plan, and um, I can share a little bit more about that. Um, but we also developed this uh, strategy called a restoration staircase, and that was a design that would allow us to kind of look at this project over um, the life of the project and really think about were there places where we needed to pause or whether we could go all the way to the goal of 90% tidal marsh and 10% ponds. Um, yeah, so we're, we just finished phase one and we're about to start phase two. And um, some of the questions that we need to answer will help make that decision for us about where we may, whether we can reach that goal of the 50 year goal or whether there may be some place we need to pause in between. Next slide. So this is just an example. Uh, John Bourgeois mentioned the big table yesterday. It's like 11 pages of uh, charts and graphs that 
um, really exemplify the things that we needed to study. This is just one example. We set restoration targets and things we were going, of where we wanted to be at the end of the pro project, uh, how we would monitor the project and what the scale of the project was. Next slide. And then thinking about our, how we were making the decision in terms of time frame. Stuart mentioned like five to 20 year projects. This is a 50 year project. Um, and then we set management triggers. You know, there are thresholds for NEPA and CEQA that we couldn't fall below, you know, for significant impacts. But we set management triggers above those so that we could think about whether we needed to take action um, before there were uh, significant effects. And then design sets of applied studies that we've been pursuing over the past 15 years, as well as potential management actions that we would take if we started seeing decreases in um, habitat or any of the objective targets. Next slide. So this is just an example of that, what I was just saying, um, that we designed the stoplight categories to really kind of give us a visual that is both quantitative and based on both quantitative and qualitative data, thinking about each objective and where we fell in this um, sort of graphic. And a lot of the projects did really well, some not as well. And so there are opportunities for us to really evaluate and think about um, science going forward. Next slide. And so just reporting out, I mentioned we've just finished phase one, um, really successfully restored some really um, quickly restoring tidal marshes. So about 3,000 acres of tidal and muted tidal restoration in phase one and about 700 acres of enhanced managed ponds. And some of you who are familiar with the project uh, know that some of those managed ponds actually included large scale applied studies that would test you know, habitat for particularly for water birds and waterfowl. So could we create islands that the, some of these species would use? Could we think about um, dividing this bottom left-hand corner, looking at dividing one of these ponds up into different salinity cells to really test the types of prey base that waterfowl might use. So in addition to the actual restoration, we did a lot of applied experiments in the first phase. Next, next slide. I also created seven miles of new trails, which include levees and boardwalks, and tons of viewing platforms and a kayak launch at Eden Landing. Next slide. So with all of that, there's still a lot of, uh, we still have some uncertainties and questions that we need to answer going forward, particularly around these issues of sediment dynamics and how the wildlife will use these changing habitats. In the first phase, we found that we still need to think about these competing interests with competing habitat needs. And that remains a challenge for the project that we're going to work to address in the next phase. Uh, still some questions about water quality and invasive species and particularly sea level rise. Uh, next slide. So at the end of the first phase, we really, I think yesterday someone mentioned, you know, it's really important in adaptive management to really stop and do a synthesis of where you are. And that's exactly what we did at the end of the first phase. We uh, contracted with Point Blue Conservation Science to actually do a science synthesis for us and really look at where we had been um, and what we'd accomplished during the first phase and what we may still need to study and taking into account new and emerging technologies. Um, for example, drones were not a technology that was really prevalent when the project started. So thinking about those types of things, remote sensing, some of the advances in technology, and then opportunities for regional collaboration. I'll mention in a later slide that there's a lot of science work going happening within the estuary and a lot that's happening more collaboratively on a regional scale than I think maybe happened 15 years ago even. And then they also did for us a separate climate synth synthesis looking at uh, changes climate change since the beginning of the project, more, the more advanced knowledge that we have now based on the balance goals update and other research and really looking at how it affects the project and ways that the project might respond. Next slide. And as part of all of that, we developed a science program framework. So really uh, trying to look at, a, a how can I say this, um, a, a strong way to look forward in our phase two science and beyond to really set it up within a structure. And we had tons of questions going into the project but now we really can refine those. And so we wanted a process to do that based on um, where we think we need to go. 
And F, that science framework will help us in maintaining and developing our ongoing science program. Next slide. And it, that science framework development process really helped us to kind of step back and reevaluate some of these major questions and objectives and take another look at some of the conceptual models and logic models and uh, really think through those with uh, the help of a body of scientists in the estuary. Uh, we convened, as part of this process, we convened a large workshop of all the scientists that have been working on the project since it started, as well as other scientists that um, had really important information to add to the process. And then that helped us develop some of these uh, case studies for four of the top questions. And those are the things that we are really going to be focusing our efforts on over uh, the initial part of phase two. Next slide. As I said before, uh, you know, I think we're all realizing more and more, and I think this is important for adaptive management as a whole, that we're really not operating in a bubble, that we have to think about the types of projects and the work and the science that's going on outside of the area, our area of focus. And a lot of these represent projects that I think are um, public and private par partnership opportunities for us. We serve, we've served on a lot of their planning committees, both the executive project manager and I, as well as uh, some of these projects actually intersect our project. And so it's beneficial to both projects to be collaborating. Next slide. And these are just a couple of examples of those. The Shoreline Project actually is adjacent and abuts and is part of our project, as well as uh, Valley Water is doing some work at Pond A8 to reconnect creeks and that we have great opportunities on both of those projects to both collaborate and share resources. Next slide. Again, just emphasizing the, the regional science that's developed since we started this project. Uh, Valen's goals update was completed in 2015, Adaptation Atlas, uh, Bay Adapt, and then the Wetlands Regional Monitoring Program. All of these are opportunities, particularly the Regional Monitoring Program, for us to share resources and contribute to their efforts, as well as take lessons learned from some of these projects um, and science and integrate them into the Salt Pond project. Next slide. And this is just an example of uh, new learning since the project began. Uh, the the Balin's Goals update recommended uh, one of the climate adaptation measures, and it's also in the adaptation atlas that transition zones can be a beneficial uh, feature at the back ends of tidal marshes and help with migration space, as well as opportunity for species to get out of the bay um, when sea levels rise. And so we have actually added transition zones to the design of our marsh restoration projects, not the managed ponds, but at the back edges of those marshes. And that's something that wasn't included in the original designs 15 years ago. Uh, next slide. And it's just an example of what that looks like in, uh, in a concept. This is Ravenswood in Menlo Park. One of the ponds that's being restored in phase two actually has on the, the, brown, um, the brown piece going north and south and then diagonally next to All-American Canal. There's actually 24 acres of transition zone that will be created in that project. And that will create that buffer between um, rising seas and, and the land. Next slide. So wrapping up, uh, phase two science is gonna be moving forward based on what we learned from phase one and some of these uh, climate synthesis and collaboration that we've been involved in, really taking adaptation and resilience into account, probably way more so than we did at the beginning of the project. Next slide. So uh, just a few things, you know, it was, it's been really helpful to have this robust adaptive management plan from the start, you know, that that big table and a lot of the scientific uh, planning and collaboration that happened at the beginning. The applied studies that we've done have been large, mostly large scale and have really contributed to what we know now, but then even raised more questions. So we continue to make the trip around that loop, uh, the adaptive management loop uh, through monitoring and evaluation, but being cognizant of changes in not just the system, but to large scale external changes and hopefully being able to take uh, some of these collaborative efforts to a new science that as it comes out to help us have a new understanding of 
where we need to go on the project. Next slide. I think that's it. So yeah, it's been it's fun to be here and hear about other adaptive management projects uh, in the Delta and to be able to kind of think about how we can learn from what's happening in the Delta for our project and maybe share some of our experiences too. So thank you. Thank you, Donna, for that fantastic talk. Um, we have time for one question, and I see that Dylan has posted something in the chat. So would you like to ask your question, Dylan? Um, hi, Donna, thanks for the great talk. Um, so I'm just curious, uh, we, as part of our Delta ADAPTS um, effort, looking at climate change impacts in the Delta, um, have certainly identified the need for expanding upland transition zones as a key adaptation measure for tidal wetlands. Um, and I'm curious if you have any lessons learned from sort of moving to integrate transition zones into restoration planning and any potential stumbling blocks or um, approaches that might help speed that integration. Thanks. Well, I think um, Stuart can probably answer this as well and, and Meg as well. I think you know, originally when we started talking about these, you know, fill fill in the bay, right, was not allowed. And so I think having really good conversations with not only regulators, but other scientists on how to actually plan these areas, because some of these will involve fill. And I think just being able to um, rely on the science, that's been helpful. I mean, the science that really supports right now this as an adaptation measure for climate change. So I think both working with regulators and this and scientists are helpful. And I see Elaine's hand up. We'll go with Elaine and then move on to our next speaker. Go ahead and unmute yourself, Elaine. Thanks. Um, I was curious, Donna, about um, how you guys approached rail monitoring for the adaptive management monitoring. Yeah, so we've relied on tidal, uh, tidal marsh recovery goals. And then the monitoring generally uh, is led by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, one of the landowners. And so that really helps um, with uh, monitoring efforts and designing the monitoring program. And what Do you have something specific you're interested in? Yes, I'm asking because my project, um, we're monitoring for rails as well, although we're in Sassoon Marsh. so having a Ridgeways rail present is very unlikely. And I guess I had somewhat of a hard time coming up with, you know, a trigger. In fact, I don't think I put a trigger for that one because there's not much if you can do if you don't get rails coming onto your restoration site. Yeah, I'm just we, curious. Yeah, we it. Set it up. Uh, we're not doing monitoring for rails and mice until um, we have tidal marsh established. And I think that the target for that was like 10 or 15 years. Uh, the island ponds uh, that were restored at the, as part of the initial stewardship plan initially on the project had uh, marsh established a lot quicker than we thought it would. It, it had established in like eight years where we thought it would probably be 15. And so they did do uh, rail, monitoring, rail and mice monitoring and actually found rails. So I think we related it to marsh establishment and then began monitoring after the marsh established. Okay, thank you for answering my question. Great, thank you so much, Donna. And we do have, uh, I think, a couple questions in the chat for you if you want to head over there. Um, and we, our final speaker for this session is Denise Reed. Um, I'd like to invite Denise to share her screen, and she's going to talk a little bit about flow actions to benefit Delta smelt. Great, thank you. Um, so you can hear me okay and you can see the slides, correct? Yes, I see you nodding. Okay, uh, thanks everybody. Thanks for the opportunity to be here today. I'm gonna uh, switch gears a little bit and talk about um, um, some adaptive management-like procedures that I put together in a project a couple of years ago. And the objective here was to think about how flow actions in the Delta uh, could benefit uh, Delta smelt. So Delta smelt, uh, particular challenges, I think, uh, for the adaptive management loop that we're trying to close here this morning. Um, very short life cycle, um, about a year, sometimes two. 
Um, so a lot can go wrong quickly. Um, maybe that also means that we can get a response uh, fairly quickly too, but, but the challenge is that you really need to learn. Um, forest. Uh, there are some key things that we don't really know much about in Delta Smelt, uh, why they move or what triggers that movement, uh, where they spawn, under what conditions. And, and in the last few years, um, anything to do with Delta Smelt and management actions has been particularly challenged by the very low catch numbers that the regular surveys are, are producing. At the same time, um, as I put this together a couple of years ago, there were some really interesting emerging things that, that were great to be able to think about taking advantage of. One of them, for instance, which is now probably fairly well established, is the deployment of cultured fish raised in the lab in cages in the Delta so that you could put them in different situations, different conditions and get some kind of really controlled assessment of, of things like growth and, and feeding and things like that, albeit within a caged environment. Lots of ongoing work that's relevant to uh, food and food web issues uh, that's pertinent to Delta smelt. And then the other thing uh, for this is that there's lots of active uh, management being undertaken and being planned and considered. So this is the science plan that I put together for CAMP a couple of years ago now. Um, again, the focus here was on understanding mechanisms by which conditions change in the Delta as a result of flow related management actions, but also how ambient conditions um, influence Delta smelt. So this is not an adaptive management wheel. It's a Delta smelt life cycle model from, um, from the synthesis paper um, in SFUSE a few years ago. Um, and so a number of flow related management actions uh, at that time were on the table uh, some and have since uh, at the time as a result of the Delta smelt resiliency strategy produced by natural resources. Uh, and uh, recently, many of these have been um, encoded, if you like, within the uh, in the ITP and the new uh, Delta smelt biological opinion. So some examples, the North Delta food web action um, has different names in different contexts the, the one that Brittany talked about yesterday, uh, reoperation of Sassoon gates, for instance, um, summer fall habitat, you know, that's been called a number of different things in, in different contexts. The interesting thing about these management actions related to flow is that the characteristics and the specifics of which management actions are implemented and how can vary a lot from year to year. And often they target particular parts of this uh, life cycle of Delta smelt, maybe in the, in the summer and fall, for instance, um, an area of, of some concern. And so when an action is trying to target a particular uh, part of this life cycle, then within any year, the antecedent conditions, if you like, what the system is actually like at the time that the action is taken can influence the outcomes. And I think a really good example of that is probably the, the 2017 um, 4X2 action undertaken under the previous biological opinion, which appears to have been limited in uh, any particular Delta smell um, response in abundance uh, in the fall and subsequent years associated with um, very high water temperatures earlier. Uh, in the summer uh, before the action uh, was taken. So we didn't get quite the same response that year as we did in uh, 2011 when the action was, was deemed to be fairly successful. So this table is out of the plan uh, that I put together for CAMT. And so this just illustrates the point that different kinds of flow related management actions, I won't go into the details of, of these individual ones, um, are planned to occur only in some water year types. Uh, and so you don't know what kind of water year type you're going to get until you actually get into that year. Um, and uh, so you could have in, say, an above normal year, you could have all kinds of different actions occurring um, in other year types. You may only have a few occurring. But at the same time, um, the context for those actions, the ambient conditions, if you like, uh, is always there. So within this plan that I put together, I, I thought about um, how to use science in three particular ways. Um, the need to predict uh, the consequences or the expectations of, of the management actions. And Michael Healy talked about, about this yesterday. We had a dialogue there about conceptual versus numerical tools and things like that. So, but you still, you need some way of thinking in advance what the, what the action is gonna do so that you know if you actually get it. 
Then surveys and monitoring things like that to detect whether or not that effect uh, was realized. But at the same time, and I think this is really important, we really want to over time build understanding. I often get frustrated with an adaptive management loop that seems to kind of close in and of itself. And I always think it's really more like a spiral that actually is advancing something uh, over time. And so increasing understanding through the adaptive management also, but also bringing in understanding that is gained about the system outside of the context of the particular management action. So we today we're talking about closing the management loop. And, and that for me, in this plan was a lot of that was about delivery of information and not really not waiting from the science perspective to publish the paper and get it all out through peer review that just simply takes too long we need to be a little bit more responsive and we need to generate timely and usable information a number of ways that that can be done and they're going to vary uh, from different actions and with different kinds of outcomes. And so one of the challenges in this closing the loop is producing information in a timely fashion that somebody can use, but also doing it in the context of kind of what I'm calling on this slide scientific best practices uh, that we're all familiar with. And so um, there is that takes some quite specific uh, thinking about. In the in the uh, Delta Smelt Science Plan, I put forth a structure uh, for doing this kind of thinking that had two key elements. Um, as I think Brittany mentioned yesterday with the, the North, North Delta Food Web Action, doing things every year is, is really challenging. And so you can't start the whole process every year from scratch. Uh, the idea is to have, the idea that I was putting forward is to have a, a three year kind of planning cycle where you lay, okay, what kinds of things might I be thinking about doing? What kinds of management actions are on the table? Um, what are the research needs and opportunities uh, that I need? Um, what are, the, what are the, the real information gaps and how can I uh, conduct studies or take the actions in a way that will uh, illuminate those particular issues? And then what kind of synthesis? I'm not gonna talk much about synthesis today, but clearly it's an important part of the ultimate delivery of information. The idea then would be within the context of a three year uh, kind of implementation of a science plan, there would be annual supplements where one would think of specifically about what was going to go uh, on that year. And so I thought about uh, and proposed kind of structures uh, for doing this. And so what you can see here is, is the idea that if you wanted to have a, a three year plan here, then there you see there are three columns here. The one on the right talks about synthesis and we'll, we'll put that on the side for, for lack of time at the moment. But you'd start a three year science plan. It's okay, what are the flow actions that are on the table? Let's get some preliminary plans together for those. Um, let's uh, think about what the research needs are that are out there. And then, and then there's this important, the green bar going across there is, okay, that could be a very, very long list of things. There needs to be some kind of reality check at some point fairly early in the process about what kind of resources we might have. And, and above and above ongoing existing programs, obviously within the Delta for, for Delta Smelt, you know, we have a lot of more relevant monitoring that already goes on under the auspices of IEP. But what else do we need above and beyond that? What modeling do we need? What additional sampling do we need? What additional kind of lab studies might we need to, to get the most out of the information? But then we also have to think about, so that can't be kind of an infinite list. There has to be some kind of check on, on what's reasonable to do. And then as we've talked a lot so far in, the, in this forum about the need to engage from the science side with the management side, then there's a prioritized step. And, and I was preparing this for CAMPT, the Collaborative Adaptive Management Team, and, and that's a great forum for direct science management engagement. And so that's where you would prioritize the research topics that will be pursued in those three years but also what you really wanted to get out of uh, understanding these actions were they uh, to be implemented. And so that gives you a, a three year science plan that then you would, and this is a kind of one way of closing the loop, that way you would revisit that every three years. You would come back and say, okay, what have I learned? What are the new sets of research opportunities? What do I need to think about in terms of, what do I really wanna learn now about my flow management actions? But I think that the annual supplement is is the most challenging part of this, and so I, I think that you know this is where this is where you really can try to get to close the loop on a much more uh, frequent uh, timescale. 
So the idea is going into any in any water year, and I'll talk about the timing of this on the, on the next slide. Um, there's a three year science plan that's ongoing and we're getting into the year and we want to think, OK, so we've got the context of that three year science plan. We've also got the the potential that we actually took the action last year or the year before. So there's a real opportunity uh, with these particular kinds of flow actions to ask that question what happened last time we did the action, right? What have we learned since last time we did the action? What did we really get out of that? And implicitly then, how can we apply that in thinking about not only how we implement the action this time, but how we uh, go about the predict, detect, and understand kind of science aspects of this adaptive management process. And so at some point, you have an expectation of what the water year is going to be. Uh, you want, you know something or you can um, bracket anyway, the character of the potential ambient conditions when the action is taken and think about how it would actually work, how much water might be moved in what direction, in what way, for how long, under what conditions. And we have pretty good um, physical models that allow us to at least to look at uh, things like salinity, changes and patterns and to some extent uh, water quality in some parts of the uh, of the estuary and and you know to some extent turbidity too so these are the, some of the key factors for delta smelt and so we can do some predictions we can think about what kind of detection we have available what's already on the ground what kind of surveys are ongoing but then what do we need and and do that in this annual context of and so of 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 the specific actions that are going to be taken what that does is it allows you to take advantage of opportunities that may come up that may not be available last year. There might be a, you know, Delta Science Program funded study that can be leveraged to understand your action. There might be a, a Prop 1 study that, you know, really could actually add some value if, if some additional sampling was done uh, around your action. So thinking broadly about the kind of scientific arena and what can be brought to bear on the action in this particular year um, uh, that you're trying to move forward. Um, again, that check at the bottom about resource availability, and then uh, we move forward. The challenge here is that this all has to be done very quickly if, if within this annual cycle. Uh, this is, uh, I don't know, I'm not gonna go through all the details on here, but, but as you saw on the previous um, uh, life cycle diagram, a lot of those actions target uh, summer and fall. And so it's not until you get to this time of year where we are now, you know, January, February, March, that you really kind of can see the water year uh, setting up. But if you don't start thinking about what you're going to do until this time of year, and it actually has to be put on the ground within a few months, then that's really difficult. So the idea is to start really early. Uh, you have this three year plan with many kind of broad things laid out to start going back to the three year plan, okay, what could be on the table? What have we learned? What can we use? What do we need? Let's get a plan and let's execute it. Now, you know, this is very broadly laid out here in the, in the Delta Smell Science Plan. I spent a fair amount of time kind of trying to provide some guiding questions for this kind of thinking. Importantly though, this relies on a really nimble, active and open dialogue uh, between um, the managers, the decision makers, uh, and the scientists. So um, there are some implementation challenges to this, as you can imagine. Um, and, you know, it, it really brings up this idea in terms of closing the loop. Um, I think perhaps the question is, how quickly can we really learn? It's really tough to do that from year to year. If you've only just finished taking the action in, in September, of year one, you know, how long is it until you get the zooplankton samples picked, for instance, to actually understand what you measured back then? And then even take then, you know, one has to have time to make sense of what's going on. So this is this is really difficult to do it on this kind of time scale. As I just mentioned, it requires intense coordination and communication. Um, and the other thing I think we need to remember is that while this is on focused on uh, flow related management actions, that's just a subset of the issues that all the managers and decision makers are trying to juggle in relation to Delta smelt and water management in the Delta. So there's a lot going on 
and there's a lot that needs to be thought about for this. So that in itself, getting the focus, getting that structure right is, is quite important. Um, resources are also required, and, and I think that's come up in, in, in all of the talks so far. So what could help? How could we kind of help ourselves close the loop a little bit better? Um, I'd like to think that having a structured approach of the kind that I have just whizzed through uh, in this talk that I laid out in the Delta Smelt Science Plan really helps. Leaving it to an ad hoc kind of, oh yeah, we'll look at the monitoring data when it comes out and we'll work out what we're going to do with it. I don't think that really helps you uh, make that uh, change and close the loop. In the in the science plan, I really tried to make it clear that I thought that it had to be somebody's job. Whenever well, you have to be nimble here, we have to be tracking a lot of information, what's going on about the actions, what's going on in science, what new developments are going on, what new techniques could we use? That takes somebody really on point um, to do it. Uh, I believe, and uh, you, if you heard my questions of Michael yesterday, you know, I believe that process-based predictive tools, um, preferably quantitative, are, um, are really helpful in this. They can help you do the kind of, uh, Michael called it, gaming of actions, but really look at lots of different options of we could do it this way, we could do it this way. How would that be relative to if we didn't do it at all, those kinds of things. It can do that numerical experiment, a comparison to the no action condition, which of course you can never actually have in the field. There is only one delta, there's only one, um, you know, August the 27th to move water on and so in any one year. So those kinds of comparisons with process-based predictive tools I think could be really useful. Um, and then particularly for delta smelt, of course, uh, detection is a problem. Um, I do think that uh, for many of these flow related management actions, there are other outcomes other than a particular benefit in a result in terms of the uh, abundance of Delta smelt, for instance, which which could be really useful. You know, are we are go if our goal of the action is to increase food availability to benefit Delta smelt, are we actually increasing the food availability? You know, is a separate question from are we actually benefit benefiting Delta smelt? So thinking about um, if you like, intermediate outcomes and making sure we're getting those as opposed to the ultimate outcome of, of Delta Smelt uh, could be could be quite useful too. So that's all I have today. Um, hopefully I've left a couple of minutes for questions and I'll leave you with this rather murky looking slide of um, Liberty Island. Thank you. Thank you so much, Denise. That was a fantastic talk fit into a very small, um, short time. We have time for one question, if anyone wants to put in the chat or add, uh, raise their hand. I think Clint added a, a rather long comment here. Go ahead, Clint. Hi, Denise. Hi, Clint. Uh, great presentation. Just um, it, the words that you used, like nimble and detection, uh, made me think about real-time tools and not only planning, but but getting in the hands of operators predictive models that are actually used by operators day to day, week to week. Because there is so many things you have to balance with the, figuring out the ambient conditions. If it's a certain kind of water year, you may or may not be able to take the actions that's in your plan. And so that there's a there's a step between the really good ideas and plans and tools rules need tools yeah yeah no th no they do I, I think that um the way i was thinking about the the uh, how to use the models to uh, think about the actions was not in terms of a water operations management many of these actions are uh, written into these various regulatory documents at the moment. So they're kind of, you know, going to be taken. The question is, what kind of effect are we going to get and 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 how are we going to take it? And so I think rather than a, a kind of real time forecasting tool and, and within the context of Delta Smelt, you know, that may be uh, something to be considered in relation to um, uh, operations for OMR and, and things like that, as opposed to these um, uh, other kinds of if for, relative to entrainment issues, but relative to these kinds of actions, I think that this is a kind of um, even a, a nimble planning process. And so the idea that we want to, you know, if we've got a 
we've got a few weeks, perhaps a month, to think of how we might do what the trade-offs are in in doing reoperating Sassoon gates in multiple different ways, for instance. And we need to have we need to get some modeling. We want to do that iteratively if we can. We want to look at it. We want to think about it. We want to do it again. And so that's what I meant by nimble rather than kind of I didn't mean nimble. I meant nimble planning, I guess, probably, um, and nimble learning in the annual cycle as opposed to nimble management. Hopefully that's that's clearer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Denise. Um, I invite more questions to continue in the chat. But right now, I want to thank all of our speakers during this session. It's been a slew of very impressive talks. And I'm going to let you all go off to a break right now. But um, since we went off over a little time here, I'm going to invite you to come back at 1040 to begin our next session for today. So thank you for being here for this session and we'll see you soon.
All right, welcome back from the break, everybody. Um, I had to log off and rejoin to share my screen. Um, can someone just confirm that they can see my screen share? You can see your screen. Excellent, thanks. Um, well, good morning, everybody. I hope you enjoyed a short break. Um, and welcome to the Adaptive Management Surprises and Successes Lightning Talk session. We're excited to present a series of talks on a diverse set of projects from throughout the estuary. We appreciate you taking the time to join us and encourage you to share any thoughts or questions on the forum Miro board, which you can find a link to in the chat. So quick um, agenda for our session this morning. Um, we'll be about five minutes off to account for the time difference and that will just cut into our breakout group discussions at the end. Um, so uh, you can adjust all of these times about five minutes, but we'll start with um, an overview, which I'll be giving. Um, then we'll move into our lightning talks, which will happen back to back. Those are pre-recorded. Um, following those, all of the lightning talk presenters will be available for a group question and answer um, for about 15 minutes, at which point we will um, head to some of our smaller breakout group discussions. And those smaller breakout group discussions, um, you know, really just intended to provide a space for you to maybe meet someone that you haven't met before, catch up with someone you haven't seen in a while, and digest some of the content. Um, after lunch, we'll be reconvening for afternoon workshops, one on um, adaptive management permitting and the other on the Delta landscape scenario planning tool. Um, so thanks again for joining us. And we've really enjoyed um, all of your interactions with the mural board so far. It's been a really great tool. And I picked this quote from yesterday's mural board. I'm not sure who put it up, but thank you, whoever did. Um, and I thought it was sort of a good lead into our lightning talk session today. So it's Mike Healy encouraged uh, progress over perfection with integrated management models and experiments and noted that failure is also a key way of learning. There was an encouragement to not try to wait for models to be perfect. And I think, you know, for all of those of us who have worked on restoration and management in the system, we know that um, if we waited for everything to be perfect, probably nothing would ever get done. Um, and, you know, this kind of harkens back to this whole past year, which has been a time of unprecedented uncertainty for us all. You could say that we've been adaptively managing our lives, finding surprises and hopefully some successes along the way, too. This ultimately is not too different from our work adaptively managing complex environmental systems, where we've learned to expect the unexpected, learn from our colleagues and adapt our work accordingly. Yesterday, we heard about the process of adaptive management planning, which is a key foundation for successful projects. However, we all know that even the best laid plans can lead to both unexpected surprises and unexpected successes. As Stuart drove home in his talk earlier today, closing the loop happens whether you plan for it or not. This session is intended to highlight projects that rolled with the punches, dealt with the changes, and managed to adapt. So what do we mean by surprises in the context of adaptive management? They can sometimes feel a little like this. And sometimes these surprises happen when target project outcomes aren't met. This can occur when internal feedbacks are too strong to meet target conditions, when uncertainty in the conceptual model led to different outcomes, or when unanticipated events such as species invasions change the project trajectory. However, they can also occur when project objectives are achieved, but create unintended consequences that need to be addressed. We'll hear about this particular situation um, during Marilyn Lada's talk uh, in this session. That's what we mean by surprises. What do we mean by success? In a 2007 paper by Joy, Let by Joy Zedler, she asked readers to carefully consider when to use the word success to describe restoration. For the purposes of this session, we want to focus on viewing success um, specifically in the context of adaptive management. And this doesn't count on everything going right. It just depends on being responsive to things when they don't proceed as expected. Projects where things go wrong can be just as important as projects that meet all of their, their objectives, provided that the outcomes are clearly communicated and adaptive measures are attempted. Adaptive interventions may require several attempts to reconcile issues with the project, but they also inform future projects about how the system operates. 
when we think about adaptive management in our day-to-day -day lives, many of us are really thinking about the planning and implementation at the project scale, what's right in front of us. These project level results then inform understanding at the program level, which in turn drive efforts across the system. And critically, these system level insights inform conceptual models that then influence subsequent projects and programs. As many of you know from experience, sustained communication, which has come up a number of times already today, is a critical piece linking projects together and ultimately allowing them to adapt. And this on the ground practice of sharing information is also linked to ecological theory, particularly in the foundational work of C.S. Holling on adaptive management and nested adaptive cycles. Um, I was pleased to, to see this pop up in Mike Healy's talk yesterday and learn a little bit more about the direct connections of our adaptive management frameworks in the Delta to C.S. Holling's work um, in broad, uh, broader work on adaptive management. And for those of you who are familiar, you know that in this framework, resilience is ultimately strengthened by links between efforts across scales. And I really liked the way Denise uh, in her previous talk put this sort of where the wheel is really a spiral. Um, and so here we kind of see that idea in action. So we start with project level adaptive management, which occurs at a relatively small scale on a relatively short time frame. This project level management and its outcomes then inform and are informed by nested adaptive management of projects at the program level, which out of necessity occurs on a larger spatial scale and a longer time frame. In aggregate, these programs and projects inform the broader adaptive management approach at the system or landscape level. In this figure, the two-way arrows represent the adaptive feedbacks that occur between scales. Across a complex system like the San Francisco estuary, many adaptive cycles exist simultaneously in a continuum that ultimately drives adaptive management at the landscape scale, creating more robust future efforts. Opportunities to build on surprises and successes across the landscape will increase the integrity of the system as a whole. Steve Deverell's talk in the previous session, for example, showed us how pilot plot level studies have evolved over the decades into projects spanning thousands of acres with many more um, thousands of acres planned and how research incorporated into these projects is now driving the potential for carbon markets. This momentum and continuity is also evident in the development of the fish restoration program monitoring Stacey Sherman spoke about yesterday. The many examples presented at this forum underscore the considerable momentum that we have around this in the system. All of you here through your hard work, dedication and communication have played a part in facilitating landscape level adaptive management. The efforts you're engaged with now will play a critical role in the future of the system just as our present day work builds on CalFed, TreeRip, and other previous collaborative efforts. Sharing surprises and successes allows us to become more comfortable with acting in the face of uncertainty. While the stakes are high and the obstacles can seem numerous, this information sharing provides a path forward for accomplishing system-wide goals over longer timeframes. With that, I'd like to introduce you to our speakers for this morning's lightning talk session. Um, Sarah Estrella is an environmental scientist with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, studying endangered species um, and managing restoration projects in Sassoon Marsh and elsewhere in the Bay Area and Delta. Marilyn Lada is a project manager with the Coastal Conservancy. She works on small and large scale subtitle and tidal habitat restoration projects, managing the Invasive Spartina project, the San Francisco Bay Living Shorelines Project, and additional nature-based adaptation and collaborative planning efforts in the San Francisco Bay and statewide. Julian Meisler is the Baylands Program Manager with the Sonoma Land Trust, where he works on conservation and restoration in the wetlands and watersheds of northern San Pablo Bay. Meg Marriott is a wildlife biologist and acting manager for the San Pablo Bay, Marin Islands, and Antioch Dunes National Wildlife Refuges. She collaborates with partners to conserve, protect, and restore wildlife and their habitats through land management and restoration projects. Cassie Pinnell is a senior ecologist with Volmar Natural Lands Consulting and the project ecologist for the Montezuma Wetlands. She works on wetland restoration and conservation projects throughout California with an emphasis on vernal pools and tidal marsh systems. 
Shruti Khanna is a senior environmental scientist with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, where she works on remote sensing of aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems. And lastly, with a, with a great vertical picture that he provided, Ted Summers, the lead scientist at the Department of Water Resources, where he works on guiding the department's science activities. Um, so we look forward to all of their talks and engaging with you as a group after the break. So with that, Brandon, I think we can uh, start the playback of the videos. Hi, my name is Sarah Estrella with the Department of Fish and Wildlife. I was project manager for the implementation portion of the Lindsay Slough Tidal Restoration Project at the Calhoun Cut Ecological Reserve in 2014. The project is located here in Solano County in the Northwestern Delta. The original cut was dredged in 1913 to allow boat access. It was 75 feet wide and 17 feet deep and it cut off several natural arms of Lindsay Slough. Although blocking the main Calhoun cut channel was included in one of the alternatives proposed for the project, it was ultimately not chosen. The project that was chosen was breaching levees in three locations to restore tidal flow to the arms that were levied on the north and south sides of Calhoun Cut and excavating a one mile tidal channel along the historic southern arm of Lindsay Slough. The restored channel meanders through Tule Marsh, mud flats, willows, and riparian forests. Western pond turtles had been observed in the area in the Jepson Prairie Prospect Island corridor. With that in mind, the project left woody debris and basking, as basking sites for turtles. Giant garter snake was also listed as potentially occurring at the site. Suitable habitat was present and aquatic connectivity exists between the project area and the documented occurrences. However, we set traps for giant garter snakes and never found any. The project documents indicated that the California black rail, the California state threatened species, was not expected to occur in the area. However, in the spring of 2015, several California black rail pairs nested in the marsh associated with the newly constructed channel. This was the first known occurrence of nesting California black rails in the Northwestern Delta. This was very exciting. Rare plants and native fishes were also documented along the reconstruct reconstructed channel. But six years later, with continued dry conditions and few flood events, floating aquatic vegetation, particularly water hyacinth, and submerged aquatic vegetation, mostly non-native, have greatly increased in the channel, slowing flow and contributing to increased emergent vegetation growth along the banks. Most of the water flow goes through the larger, deeper Calhoun cut. Basking sites for turtles are overgrown with vegetation, And on a recent recon mission, we observed a large beaver hut and beavers. And while we did not detect black rails last month, we did see and hear several soras, another species of rail that is not listed. They were actually foraging directly on the floating aquatic vegetation. So what will the future hold for Lindsay Slough and what does adaptive management look like here? Should we go back and reconsider the other project alternatives? Will we need to dredge periodically? And how can we control or remove aquatic weeds when they are so widespread in the system? And what about no action? We did not get the species we expected, but it's habitat for other species. 
All these things will need to be considered moving forward post restoration at Lindsay Slough. My name is Marilyn Latta and I'm a project manager with the State Coastal Conservancy. I'm excited to be here today and share information about the Invasive Spartina project and our adaptive management approach to eradicating invasive cordgrass while protecting California Ridgeways Rail. This case study is an example of a common conservation dilemma, endangered versus invasive species management. Human development has led to substantial loss of habitat in the Bay where more than 80% of historic wetlands have been destroyed. Wildlife dependent on wetlands have now become endangered in some cases, and human action led to the introduction of highly invasive species. The Coastal Conservancy, Fish and Wildlife Service, and our 150 landowning partners have to carefully balance sometimes conflicting goals over the 70,000 acre project area. We do this through adaptive management and phasing of actions, including targeted invasive plant monitoring and herbicide treatment, matched with carefully planned restoration, and annual surveys to assess the population of rail. We reconsult with Fish and Wildlife Service at regular intervals to carefully move forward. Invasive Spartina was first introduced in the Bay in the 1970s as part of a restoration project. Why is it a problem? It degrades the eco native ecosystem by outcompeting native plants and reducing biodiversity. It dominates mudflats, reducing shorebird habitat, endangers native Pacific cordgrass, reduces flood control capacity, and ultimately causes failed tidal marsh restoration. Native and non-native Spartina have hybridized and can provide short-term benefits to rails. It created brand new marsh where there was none before by invading mudflats, and it grew taller than the native and provided cover at high tide. Also, the hybrids outcompeted native cordgrass and other vegetation so that once the invasive was removed, there was a deficit in ecosystem function that has been temporarily provided by hybrid, but is usually provided by native plants. Initial successful control began in 2005 and reduced the invasive dramatically in the initial years of the project. Rail response was delayed by approximately two years, so we started to see declines in their population by 2009. The declines have also occurred in areas of the bay where there isn't invasive control and are due to multiple factors that are hard to tease apart. In 2011, through consultation with Fish and Wildlife Service, we stopped treatment entirely at 26 sites and began the revegetation program. The project couldn't initiate planting efforts earlier due to the risk of rehybridization. In 2012, restrictions were reduced to 11 sites and to be renegotiated after the rail population had rebounded to a target of 80 more birds than a 2010 baseline for three consecutive years. This goal was met in 2017. The restoration program is guided by our 2011 plan, which was informed by plant and wildlife biologists from multiple agencies and universities. The overarching goal is to rapidly enhance habitat for rails at ISP treatment sites. It is implemented on a baywide scale and with a focus on increasing cover from predators on the marsh plain. We focus on reestablishing critical missing components of healthy rail habitat, including cover for roosting, nesting, and high tide refuge. We implement adaptive management, learning from our planting efforts, modifying the experimental designs based on results from the previous year. For example, we saw a need for caging of young seedlings because of goose grazing, and we have adjusted target elevations over time. In addition to plantings, we recognize the need for better habitat support during high tides. Mortality during king tides led to development of high tide refuge islands, small elevational features constructed in the marsh plain. The islands have been designed by H.D. Harvey and are 1.7 feet above the marsh plain surface, which has been adapted to and increased over time since the pilot year in 2012. They're 250 square feet and constructed with excavated bay mud, and then planted with salvage vegetation from the excavation area and with one gallon marsh gum plants. Plantings at Eden Landing Ecological Reserve starting in 2014 have expanded far beyond what is mapped in this slide and are tracked via our annual site and photo monitoring. 
This drone shot shows the substantial expansion of native plantings and the rail population at this site is rapidly expanding from no birds in 2018 to eight birds detected in 2020. In summary, we are carefully phasing actions in a stepwise approach that considers specific habitat components that are needed to support rails and provide for a native and healthy bay ecosystem in the long term, instead of the short term and unsustainable benefits provided by invasive Spartina. The overall cost and level of effort to complete the eradication is higher due to this adaptive management, but is led by a collaboration of many landowning partners and ultimately protects all of the past and future tidal marsh restoration projects in the Bay. We couldn't accomplish this work without our many Baywide partners who are led by Olufsen Environmental and California Invasive Plant Council. Thank you. Hello, I'm Julian Meisler with Sonoma Land Trust, and today I'll present our effort to adaptively manage shoreline erosion using a nature-based solution within an active restoration site. In October 2015, we breached a 130-year-old levee on the north shore of San Pablo Bay with the goal of restoring nearly 1,000 acres of subsided diked agricultural baylands to tidal marsh. Our monitoring since then indicates that the site's on a positive trajectory. We documented copious fish and wildlife and the rate of sediment accretion has exceeded our estimates. However, we've also documented significant erosion along the shoreline. And to explain the cause, I'll step back a few years and highlight two design components and the hard choices made in managing the project. While we would rely on the muddy tidal waters to bring in the millions of cubic yards of sediment needed to bring the site to marsh elevation, we knew the large wind fetch that exceeds two miles in some locations would result in wind waves that could both erode our new levee and limit deposition of sediment. So our design included wave mitigation measures. First, we built roughly 500 marsh mounds across the site, which would function to break up waves as they formed. Second, our new levee would connect with the old levee to create an enclosed basin. Before breaching the outer levee, we could use tide gates and stormwater pumps to manage water levels and grow a brackish marsh. Dense bulrush roots would stabilize the mounds and ultimately help filter sediments once the old levee was breached. Simultaneously, we would establish vegetation on the new levee to help stabilize it against scour and erosion. This would take three to five additional years. As the project manager overseeing what was already a complicated design and juggling 16 grants, an EIR and eight permits, I saw a challenge in doubling the project construction timeline. Most grant windows are three years. There were questions of mercury methylation and we'd have to install tide gates and operate the pumps. While it wasn't insurmountable, I decided to take a chance and skip the pre-vegetation. We breached the old levee without pre-vegetation and monitoring began. The marsh mounds were the first to be affected. San Francisco State University graduate student Margot Bookbinder documented about a foot of erosion in the first year, creating the teardrop shape you see here. Although the erosion seemed to stabilize, Margo initiated experimental mound plantings, which took off, leading us to partner with the Invasive Spartina Project, who planted an additional 57 mounds. Whether pre-vegetation would have protected the marsh mounds is unknown, but the effect of their erosion was that wind waves reached the newly constructed levee and led to the erosion of up to nine horizontal feet of its slope, leaving a barren and compacted tidal flat and a two foot high vertical scarp at the levee toe. Establishment of intertidal and transition zone vegetation was becoming impossible. Operating under the premise that conventional shoreline armoring is incompatible with our goals, we're now adaptively managing the site using vegetation, logs, soil, and the power of currents and waves to stem erosion and reestablish the transition zone. Over the past 18 months, our crew harvested in situ plugs of Pacific cordgrass and transplanted them along the levee front as a first line of defense, 
More than 3,100 plugs were transplanted and initial survivorship is high. This summer, we will strategically embed and anchor up to 320 logs along the affected shoreline for the purpose of blocking wave energy. Simultaneous to log placement, we will place piles of coarse, dried bay mud in front of the logs, allowing wind waves and tidal currents to mobilize and redeposit it in the nearby swash bars between and in front of the logs. These swash bars or berms will serve as platforms for pickleweed and other species to colonize, take root, and further stabilize the system. Our adaptive management approach is derived from natural processes observed on site and around the bay. We'll monitor its progress, and if we're successful, we hope this will be a tool that other managers can use to manage the chronic issue of shoreline erosion within tidal marsh settings. We're grateful to the Wildlife Conservation Board for funding this project, to the San Pablo Bay National Wildlife Refuge for hosting our project and partnering with us, and to our design team, Siegel Environmental, Gillen Water Consulting, Peter Bay, and Far West Restoration Engineering. Thank you. Hello, my name is Meg Marriott, and I am the Wildlife Biologist and Acting Manager for the San Pablo Bay National Wildlife Refuge. I'd like to tell you about an incredible project that has required multiple phases and types of adaptive management over six years to achieve the desired results of the original plan. The Sonoma Creek Enhancement is a partnership project between the Marin Sonoma Mosquito and Vector Control District, Audubon, California, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to alleviate a problem common to centennial marshes in the North San Francisco Bay. Here is the location of Sonoma Creek Marsh on the San Pablo Bay National Wildlife Refuge. It is a centennial marsh that has built up to marsh plain elevation on the bay side of the Tubbs Island levee as a result of sediment pouring into the bay from years of hydraulic mining upstream during the gold rush era. The sediment built up so rapidly that the complex channel systems that bring tidal action into and out of native marshes did not establish. So when high tides and storm events brought water up onto the marsh plain, the water did not drain properly. An approximately 100 acre central basin that held water during a good portion of the year developed. The water was stagnant, allowing elbow mats to form, killing off marsh vegetation and creating the perfect environment for mass mosquito production. We also had a ponding problem along the levee where relic berms parallel to the levee were blocking the flow of water, causing the same problems. So in 2007, the Mosquito District proposed a project that would bring tidal action into the Centennial Marsh and drain the impounded areas, improving system function, alleviating mosquito production, and creating much improved wildlife habitat. We would excavate a mile long channel from Sonoma Creek through the middle of the central basin. We would excavate a lateral side channel that tied into pre-existing channels created by the Mosquito District in the Relic Firm area. In 2015, we conducted the first phase in which we excavated 4,500 linear feet of the main channel and also excavated ladder, the lateral channel. Immediately, hundreds of small side channels started to form. Draining most of the two project areas. Vegetation colonized rapidly. And wildlife began to populate the central basin. However, after three years, two large impoundment areas persisted. And the relic berm area still did not drain fully. In 2018, the Mosquito District hand ditched a short channel through an area of slightly higher elevation. 
from the distal end of the main channel to the southern impounded area. It worked. Immediately, most of the southern impoundment started draining, and within a year, the area was covered in healthy vegetation. But the larger and less accessible and less consolidated mudflat of the eastern impoundment remained. So in 2020, we brought an amphibious excavator into the area and enlarged and extended seven channels into the eastern impoundment. This was successful, and the eastern impoundment is now draining. Since the completion of phase two in October, we have experienced small areas still ponding within the project area. Over the past three months, the Mosquito District has used rotary ditching and hand shoveling to drain these areas. They have also blocked some channels to reroute the flow of water in the relic berm area. From the results we have seen with each successive adaptive action, we believe that this last round of adaptive management will allow the entire system to perform successfully. Thanks to all of our project team, and thank you. Hello, my name is Cassie Pinnell, and I'm a senior ecologist at Fulmar Natural Lands Consulting and the project ecologist for Montezuma Wetlands. Thank you for joining me today while I talk about integrating adaptive management across project phases at the Montezuma Wetlands site. Montezuma Wetlands is located in southern Solano County in the Sassoon Marsh area near the confluence of the Sacramento and San Joaquin Rivers. This 2,400 acre site once included 1,800 acres of marsh transitioning into bunch grasses and vernal pool systems in the uplands. The levees were constructed around the outer perimeter beginning in the 1870s. Since then, the site's been grazed, dry land grain farmed. The uplands have remained mainly intact, but of course the diked, formerly tidal area subsided about 10 feet. The Montezuma Wetlands Project was conceived of in the 90s as a unique privately funded project that would work with the Corps, Port of Oakland, and other dredging projects to accept sediment then to be placed within internal cells to rebuild the elevation in order res to restore the system to tidal marsh. Sediments dredged from around the bay are brought via barge to Montezuma where they're offloaded by the electrical powered Liberty offloader and pumped up to target cells on site. A key element to ensuring that the Montezuma Wetlands Project is adaptively managed and revised based on best available science is the temporal and spatial phasing. Lessons learned from phase one will help to inform both the design and management of future phases. The initial planning and permitting of Montezuma took 12 years and adaptive management was built into this project from the beginning. As part of the project's core permit, a technical review team was formed, which is chaired by Josh Collins of San Francisco Estuary Institute. The TRT is comprised of specialists covering all project areas, and the TRT members recognize that they're part of an adaptive management process. They provide recommendations on the phasing of the project, potential changes to the monitoring methods or performance standards currently described in the plans, the location of reference sites, or on any important project design and operating elements. Examples of adaptive management integrated into the project during the construction of phase one included changing the project design to include habitat for two new special status species that arrived on site during construction, the California least tern and snowy plover. Also, since sediment delivery proved to be slower than expected, the project was modified to include a staged approach of tidal restoration to phase one, with some areas being kept isolated from the initial phase breach until they reach target elevations. In addition, the project was redesigned to better support salt marsh harvest mouse based on emerging data that became available, refining the understanding of the species preferred habitat. Elevation was raised slightly to reflect updated tidal reckoning and ensure more saline conditions for promoting halophytic vegetation more typical of the Sassoon marsh. I'm excited to share 
that phase one of the Montezuma Wetlands Project was breached on October 27, 2020, returning tidal action to about 550 acres of the Montezuma site. This breach was supported in part by Measure AA funding. Now, post breach of phase one, the project is continuing to work with the technical review team on refining monitoring methodology and data analysis to assess the emerging project conditions. The project is conducting an extensive amount of chemistry and biological monitoring and measuring these against regional data and reference envelopes from a network of suitable reference sites. In addition, the project is constantly working to involve best available science and the thinking of changing advisory groups and regional monitoring efforts. Monitoring approaches will be modified as appropriate as the site continues to develop using a combination of UAV and remote monitoring with ground truthing and traditional field-based monitoring. We have been thrilled to watch wildlife returning to the Montezuma wetland site and are very much looking forward to better understanding the growth and development of California's newest marsh. For more information about the Montezuma Wetlands Project, please feel free to email me or Dr. Doug Lifton at the email addresses shown on this slide or visit our website, montezumawetlands.com. Thank you. Hi, I'm Shruti Khanna from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. My quick talk today will focus on recent analysis of treatment efficacy of aquatic vegetation over multiple years and across the Delta. I am the data czar of this study. Jeremy is the statistical brains and Luis is the guide on all things management. This work was made possible because of class maps available from two five-year airborne hyperspectral imagery campaigns over the Delta from 2004 to 2008 and from 2014 to 2018. Treatment data from 2003 to 2018 was made available by the Division of Boating and Waterways, or DBW. We selected 461 sites across the Delta as treatment and reference sites for floating aquatic vegetation, or FAV. Three these sites were chosen in three different kinds of habitats. Main channels shown in blue, flooded islands shown in red, and slow shallows or the shallow regions between small remnant marsh islands within a channel shown in green here. We also selected 133 treatment and reference sites for submerged aquatic vegetation or SAV. Over the period analyzed for this study, FAV was treated using two herbicides, 2,4-D and glyphosate, while submerged plants were treated using fluoridone pellets. This shows an example of SAV treatment and reference site pairs. My talk today focuses on FAV treatment program because these results are new, exciting, and haven't been presented yet. The mixed effects binomial model we used predicts the possibility of a pixel being FAV given the amount of herbicide sprayed per unit area and consecutive years of treatment. Site and year are considered random effects, meaning that pixels within a site and data from the same site in multiple years are treated as repeated measures, which essentially they are. The herbicide sprayed per unit area during one spray event is actually mostly fixed. As a rough estimate, DBW sprays about a gallon of herbicide per acre but they visit each site different number of times within the same season. That creates variability in herbicide sprayed per unit area over the course of one treatment season. We also fitted different separate models to each habitat because we, because we felt that efficacy would be different in all three due to very different hydrologic characteristics. The first results I'm showing here are from 2004 to 2008 data and only for sites treated with 2,4-D because glyphosate wasn't used as often in those years. So we took advantage of that to examine the efficacy of 2,4-D by itself. The x-axis is the amount of herbicide sprayed per unit area in a treatment season, and the y-axis is the probability of a pixel being FAV. I'm going to draw your attention to four takeaways from these graphs. The first 
And the simplest is that the treated sites have significantly lower cover than reference sites. This is true as soon as the treated confidence interval separates from the projected grade distribution of reference sites. The second is that repeated visits within the same treatment season increase efficacy. Now this first row of graphs is from the sites that were treated two years in a row. These are graphs when sites were treated four years in a row. And you see that in general, at least in channels and flooded islands, efficacy increases when sites are treated many years in a row. You can also see that while 2,4-D is effective in flooded islands and channels, it doesn't do that well in slow shallows. I don't have time to show the results for the 2014 to 2018 time period, but I will say that we found glyphosate was most effective in slow shallows, somewhat effective in channels, and not effective in flooded islands. We will be looking at each herbicide separately and their interaction. We will also determine how long effects last after the treatment stops. I presented the results on the SAV treatment program in the 2014 to 2018 time period at the IEP workshop, but I've outlined the main conclusions here. We found that, the end, that at the end of the treatment season, herbicide treatment only reduced cover by 10%. This reduction was not sustained until a year later. Moreover, consecutive years of treatment did not seem to have added benefit and sometimes was counterproductive. What do these two landscape scale multi-year evolutions of aquatic vegetation treatment in the Delta tell us about adaptive management? Based on the FAV study, we recommend that herbicide use be differentiated by habitat because the efficacy of the two herbicides is different in different habitats. This study can also help determine the number of times a site must be sprayed to have a significant impact and how many consecutive years it must remain on the treatment schedule. Based on the SAV study, we suggest that the concentration and exposure time or CET guidelines for estuarine environments need a serious re-evaluation. Clearly, current CET limits are insufficient for the purpose. SAV treatment also needs to take into account the hydrologic year we are in. In drought years, we recommend the treatment program needs to make sure new habitats are not colonized, while in wet years, it can turn its attention to existing nurseries in the Delta, which provide propagules for spread of SAV. Finally, we strongly advise that consistent monitoring and reference sites in addition to treatment sites are a must for evaluating efficacy. Success must be defined a priori with regards to both primary objectives, such as reducing cover, to secondary objectives, such as improved water quality, for example. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ted Summers with the Department of Water Resources, and I'm here to tell you about a novel flow experiment we did with the Sassoon Marsh Salinity Control Gate in 2018. So our target was a delta smelt habitat. Delta smelt is one of the most endangered fishes around. And the issue for uh, the species in summer through fall is that there is seasonal uh, intrusion of salinity, which reduces the range. Essentially, fish are, are somewhat forced out at Sassoon Marsh during drier periods. So we tested uh, the potential for using Sassoon Marsh salinity control gates um, to try and improve salinity conditions in Sassoon Marsh. So the gates have been constructed um, in order to improve salinities. They're tidally operated, um, and the tidal operations primarily occur uh, from fall through spring. And we tested the idea of using these same gates in order to improve habitat during summertime for delta smelt. So the basic operations occurred in 2018 on a test basis, and we provided additional delta outflow out in, in water quality. We had a number of hypotheses uh, to guide the action. So the basic idea is that lower salinity in Sassoon Marsh from gate operations would open the marsh up to delta smelt, uh, Sassoon Marsh is hypothesized to have more complex habitat, better food, which we hope will improve feeding and survival. 
this was a huge collaborative effort. We had a number of different uh, people that participated, including public water agencies, state and federal agencies. They provided a lot of guidance and regulatory support. We had support from IEP and we had a great uh, monitoring team, including staff from DWR, CDFW, UCD, uh, consultants, and USBR, and a number of other folks. The project relied on uh, a number of different types of assessment. We put a lot of thought into how to structure uh, the different actions. So we looked at things like before, during, after. We looked at regional comparisons. Uh, we also looked through modeling at how the action compared to a no action and did historical comparisons uh, with the long-term data we had through IEP. We also had a whole suite of predictions uh, to help guide the effort. So here are a few uh, quick examples here of the response of the action, um, but also the response within the marsh itself. So the big success in this adaptive management exercise was that we were actually able to do the project. So the gates were operated for about a month. In August, we saw a big response in salinity in the interior marsh and we're able to provide approximately an additional 37,000 acre feet uh, to guide the effort. Modeling of the action suggested that uh, it had a big effect on delta smelt habitat. So there was a big response and reduction in salinity and that essentially opened the door for delta smelt occupancy. So one of the big surprises was that same modeling suggested that we got a lot of bang for buck out of the action. So we did gate operations for a little over a month, but salinity improvements, habitat quality persisted well after that. The second surprise was that delta smelt seemed to respond. These are really, really low numbers of delta smelt from uh, the EDSM survey, but there's evidence from this modest number of smelt that smelt may have colonized the marsh uh, shortly after the action began and stayed a while longer. So as far as outcomes, uh, we generated uh, several nice publications out of this. I encourage you to look at those uh, to get more details. Um, but perhaps our, our proudest achievement is that the study was successful enough that this action has now been integrated into a couple new regulatory documents. So these include the 2019 biological opinion um, that includes several different water year types when the action will be further tested in our recent uh, 2020 state incidental take permit, uh, which includes an expanded range. So that's a quick introduction. Again, uh, I encourage you to look at the publications and you'll get a lot more information. Thanks very much. All right, well, thanks so much to all of our speakers. It's um, for those of you who have put together lightning talks, you know that it takes a lot of time to record, especially pre-record a lightning talk. So much appreciated to all of them and all of these different stories that reflect different ways um, that ecosystems and actions are being managed in the Delta. So we have some time now for um, for group discussion. So if you if you do have a question, I encourage you to raise your hand, put a question um, or put a question in the chat and we will we will bring those up as as they um, as they come up. And I think that, um, you know, one of the things that that struck me again is sort of this multi scale idea. Um, and here we really see ranging from the uh, the work that Marilyn Lada presented, which is is fairly system wide in the control of invasive Spartina to um, uh, and similar to Shruti Khanna's talk, very system wide down to the site scale um, that Julian, Meg and Sarah presented on um, and then to sort of this more of um, action oriented uh, management that Ted spoke about. Um, so, so yeah, a lot of information in those talks. Um, so, so again, please, please chime in. Um, and after this, we will be breaking up into um, some small groups to have more detailed conversation. Um, but 
Great, so we have one from um, Gina Darren. Gina, do you uh, do you want to turn your, your mic and if possible camera on or uh, do you want me to read this out loud for you? Oh, thanks. Thanks, Dylan. I'll, I'll just go with microphone. Um, listening to Marilyn's talk, thank you for that. I, I actually enjoyed all the talks this session. It was fantastic. Uh, but it, it struck a chord, and when we try to manage invasive species, at times we come up against the problem of the invasive, the endangered species we're trying to protect is using the invader as habitat. How do you uh, make that case to permitting agencies for the removal of the invader? Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Gina. That's definitely been a major topic of discussion um, throughout this project, and it resulted, honestly, in years of struggling with that issue because many of the mandates require the regulatory agencies to only look at short term. Um, so it's not the staff's fault. It's not. It's, it's a problem, you know, oftentimes with legislation or um, you know, evolution of our own thinking in science to focus more on long-term ecosystem health versus individual single species management. And I guess, you know, we've focused, it took a lot of meetings, a lot of collaboration, a lot of communication and involvement by many of the landowning partners in the project to help to make the case that, you know, the long-term downfalls were not um, equal, you know, far outweighed the short term impacts that we were seeing and then careful work to develop a phase strategy. So I think many of the, the lightning talks in this session focused on that, um, choosing to phase actions, carefully evaluate and reconsult. And so we've been able now with our 2018 five year biological opinion to confirm and approve phased action. So I hope that helps. Marilyn, could you actually um, specify a little bit about the, the phased action um, that's part of that BO, the 2018 BO? Sure, yeah, five minutes is so short, um, as well as for thanking all the many partners, which I never do well enough in the presentations, um, including CDFW, who's one of our grant managers right now and others. Um, but our phased approach, so there are still four sites that actually are not, um, are restricted from treatment, so that's a key thing to point out. Those are in San Leandro Bay, so Arrowhead Marsh and Mulcahy Marsh and some other sites on the San Leandro shoreline, uh, which have high concentrations of Ridgeways rail. Um, but for the other seven out of those 11 that were restricted, there's a phased approach with targeted criteria that's based on looking at the numbers of rail by year, looking at the presence of Spartina and where we might be able to go in and start treating Spartina that's less rail uh, of less rail benefit, you know, in less concentrated rail use areas, so that we target those first, continue to monitor rail, conduct revegetation, either within the site if it's appropriate with sites, species like Grindelia, if we can't plant Spartina yet, or at adjacent sites. So instead of only looking at each what we call sub area, um, looking at the surrounding region to see where we could enhance rail actions and habitat. So basically all of those criteria then get evaluated each year and we talk with the regulators about moving forward. Great, thank you, Marilyn. Very informative. Is there any other questions? Um, hands up. Appreciate that insight. So um, I think we have a uh, um, Ron Melser um, chimed in with with a link as well. So Ron, I don't know if you want to um, speak a little bit about what you've included here, and then we have Stuart Siegel's hand up after that. I don't have too much more to add, Dylan. Just need to see uh, rails being found in uh, vegetation communities that they've been found to be associated with in predictive models. So very cool. Thanks, Sarah. Great, thanks, Ron. And Ron also included a link to a paper on this topic in the chat, so folks should check that out. Um, and uh, Stuart, you have your hand up. Um, yeah, hi, thanks, Dylan. A question for Sarah Strella um, with Lindsay Slough. 
I'm, I'm curious if you've um, had the opportunity yet to look at how other kind of smaller sloughs and some of the, the very few tidal marshes up in that part of the world are doing similarly with the issue of, of both floating and submerged aquatic vegetation and if there's any hints that that's given you as to what might be able to do about what's happening at Lindsay Slough. Oh, hi, this is Sarah. Um, I have not actually studied that. All I know is from observation that there's a lot of floating aquatic vegetation in that area and a lot of submerged um, aquatic vegetation. And the biggest problem is that there's just a lot of flow going through the much larger Calhoun cut that's parallel to it. And it's just not, the water is just not flowing through the smaller Lindsay Slough channel. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of um, floating and submerged aquatics in that whole area. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that definitely helps trying to get a sense of the hydrologic and geomorphic context for how you might, um, what might promote establishment and what might help get rid of it. So yeah, that definitely helps to kind of get a sense of what works and doesn't work. Thank you. Great, thanks Stuart and Sarah for those insights. Um, so I had a question for um, for Julian Meisler um, about that sort of decision to to uh, breach or not to breach to allow for revegetation. And I'm curious. Um, so you sort of gave a um, a time frame of like three to five years of pre-vegetation um, that was sort of initially planned for. I'm curious from a kind of permitting perspective. Um, which you alluded to in your talk, how much allowing for that three to five year window for revegetation would have upended the permitting process and kind of what some of the other um, what some of the other uh, requirements that would have been added would have uh, potentially been and how that would have changed your time frame. Yeah, sure. Can you hear me OK? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. So one thing I should point out, uh, and this is an interesting piece that any uh, any project manager that's picked up a project midway through. So the, so the planning for this project began and um, well, it began and you know right after we bought the property in 2005, and then sort of the conceptual ideas came out in 2007 and were pushed forward. And you know initial conversations with permitting agencies and whatnot had happened. In late 2009, I took over the project and, um, you know, was coming up to speed rapidly uh, with a draft EIR and process. And the questions of um, the questions of how it would have changed the permitting. I'm not. I'm not actually sure. That wasn't. That wasn't a, as much of a factor for me. I think that we could have. Um, I think we could have pushed that through with the permitting agencies just based on, I mean, my experience with the permitting agencies has been that if the justification for the for doing it is sound, sound rationale, then um, then it would then it would go. I was really um, concerned with funding it. You know, it's a it was a big project. Um, we do have short windows of time to get things done and um, you know there was the question of mercury and i think that actually was was dispelled uh over time um but i wasn't enough of an expert to know at that time if that was going to come back and bite us now whether what that would have done for uh, permit negotiations i'm not sure but it, it didn't come up but it did come up in our eir process so i think uh there's there's a lot of factors to consider and really i think when you're when you're juggling, as every speaker here knows exactly what that means, um, you are looking for roots of efficiency uh, without being, um, you know, prone to error by, by rushing. I hope that 
I hope that answers. Great. Yeah, thank you for that insight, Julian. Um, so we have the potential for a few more uh, minutes of group questions here. Um, so please, if you if you have anything for um, for any of our speakers, feel free to chime in. Um, so we have um, Shruti just um, entered the chat. Shruti, are you able to turn on turn on your mic to to ask us? Sorry, I know Shruti's been having some uh, <laughs> some um, connect connectivity issues. So, um, so Shruti's question, I'll I'll read it out loud, Shruti, and you can you can um, chime in to um, uh, to correct <laughs> anything uh, from how I'm interpreting it. So Shruti's asking, was it Meg who presented on how initial plans were not effective, and subsequent adaptive management and engineering a new channel gave the desired result? Um, and Trudy's question is, could such a rethinking of the Calhoun Cut project potentially improve its functionality? So I think the, the first question there, and I think, yes, that was a part of um, Meg's presentation, was um, the additional management action having, having an impact, um, uh, the additional management action having an impact, but needing subsequent steps. Um, and I'm curious, uh, Sarah, from your perspective um, in the Calhoun Cut and Lindsay Slough area, whether um, you, you feel like an intervention like that could potentially um, change some of the dynamics that you're seeing out there. Um, sorry, can you rephrase or repeat the question for me? Yeah, no problem. Um, whether sort of if there's any engineering um, interventions that could be okay. implemented at the site, like what you know, creating new channels, et cetera. I think geomorphically, it's quite a bit different than the site that Meg was talking about um, in the the Valens, But okay, so as far as you mean, would it help to make that channel wider? Maybe um, it would help. There's um a lot of native american burial sites on the site um many of which were exhumed but there could be many more that were not and so that was part of the reason for not excavating the channel more um in fact they were worried that it would erode and become wider over time and expose some of those sites um so that's not really an option. Um, and I know that it, I wasn't involved in the planning portion of the project, um, but I know that the, the option to block more of Calhoun Cut was just very expensive. And we, we had a limited budget and we spent it all on just the, the channel and the breaches. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question. And I'm looking at the chat. It looks like there might be something else. One cut dominates movement. Oh, some change. Yeah. Let's just see. Um, I so I'm reading Steve Rodriguez's comment. Oh, okay. I guess did I answer everything? Yeah, I think um, and we, we do want to uh, transition to our breakout groups okay. momentarily. So, um, no, I think that is a really interesting answer, and I think that connection, especially of you know cultural artifacts, those sorts of needs, um, really brings in one of the themes from yesterday as far as the broader human dimension that all of our, you know, sort of ecologically minded um, projects are existing. And I think that's that's a perfect example of that. Um, so we do want to make sure that we have some time to sort of interact in, in smaller breakout groups. Um, so uh, we have some breakout group questions. You can find them on the mural and then um, they'll be also uh, pasted into the chat. Um, so for those of you who can stick around for the last 15 minutes, it'll be great to work through these questions um, about uh, a, a few different aspects of evaluating surprises and successes, 
and how that relates to the broader picture of project adaptive management. So um, thanks to every all the presenters, all the question askers, um, and we look forward to chatting with you on small groups and then um, uh, hopefully seeing most of you back for our afternoon sessions. So thanks. <laughs>